please be seated. Good afternoon. I have already introduced myself to some of you, but for those who are joining now, my name is Annabel Ewing, uh, and I am the Dep Deputy Presiding Officer of the Scottish Parliament. Uh, I think I have to advise for the information of some folk uh, what I look like. That's a bit of a challenge. So I will simply say that I have shortish hair and I am wearing glasses. It is my great pleasure to welcome you all here, uh, both in person and those who are joining us online, to our debating chamber of the Scottish Parliament for this very special event to mark International Day of Persons with Disabilities. And I do hope that today's event provides you with an opportunity to engage with your Parliament and indeed today is about you and listening to what you have to say. And it is now my pleasure to introduce to you the presiding officer of the Scottish Parliament, Alison Johnson, MSP. Alison Johnson is unable to join us in person today, but has recorded a message, a message recorded last week from the debating chamber, and she will be welcoming everyone to the Scottish Parliament today. So I call online the broadcast from the Right Honourable Alison Johnson, MSP, Presiding Officer. Good afternoon. I'm Alison Johnston, MSP, Presiding Officer of the Scottish Parliament, and it's my pleasure to welcome you all to Holyrood today. I'm so sorry I'm not there in person with you. I was very much looking forward to getting the chance to meet with you and to listen to you and to celebrate this important day with you. And it's only the most unavoidable circumstances that mean that I can't be with you today. But I very much hope that this event is the first of many and that I'll be with you next time. In my role as presiding officer, one of my responsibilities is representing the Scottish Parliament internationally and at home here in Scotland at important events such as this, marking International Day for Persons with Disabilities. And I'm very grateful for these opportunities, which allow me to share the important message that the Scottish Parliament belongs to all of Scotland's people. When I was elected as presiding officer, I welcomed greater diversity amongst members returning this session, but I stressed that I want this Parliament to be truly inclusive and we need your help to achieve this. Many of you will know Pam Duncan Glancy, MSP, and Jeremy Balfour, MSP, real champions for disabled people, both here in the Parliament and beyond. They approached me on behalf of the Cross Party Group on Disability with the idea to hold this, and I was determined to see that this essential event would go ahead and I was also determined that I would be involved in this event because it's such an important opportunity to come together to mark this International Day, to recognise and value the role that you, that disabled people play in our society. Modern Scotland is rich and diverse. We're all different in so many ways, but we still need to work at celebrating that diversity. And I believe that today's event is a move in the right direction. Disabled people form almost 30% of Scotland's population. It's important that they, that you hear today, feel valued and listened to, and that you experience equality. And I know, unfortunately, this isn't always the case. We know that disabled people face barriers to full participation in Scottish life and have to challenge the issue of access and of equality when that's nothing less than a human right. Article 1 of the Declaration of Human Rights states that all human beings are born free and equal in rights and dignity. It's for that reason that equal opportunities is one of the Scottish Parliament's founding principles. Our other principles include accessibility and the sharing of power. And it's on that foundation that we have shaped our modern participative Parliament, a Parliament, I hope, fit for the 21st century. And as we approach our 25th anniversary, it's only right that we reflect on the past 25 years, that we look at our successes, at areas of progress, and of course, where there's still work to be done. Today, it's important that we hear your voices to help us do so. 
Over the years, we as a parliament have worked hard to ensure that all of Scotland's voice is heard. And that includes the voice of disabled Scots. We're working hard to remove any barriers that exist to promote equal access for disabled people and full participation in the decision-making process. There have been many parliamentary inquiries over the sessions that have looked into some of the barriers disabled people have encountered and continue to encounter. Most recently, the Citizen Participation and Public Petitions Committee carried out an inquiry on barriers to engaging with the Parliament. Disabled people were one of the groups that the committee prioritised. And the, re the recommendations from the resulting report have been debated in this chamber recently. And there's already some work being carried out to break down the barriers that were identified in the inquiry, such as increasing the diversity of committee witnesses. And one of the steps that is being taken forward to improve witness diversity is preparing calls for views and reports in Easy Read for adults with learning disabilities. Although we work hard to remove challenges and barriers, there is still more we can do. So, to everyone in Parliament and online today, I would ask one thing. Please keep on engaging with your Parliament. Keep on raising your voice. Keep helping us to change anything that's not good enough. And together, let us build a better and fairer Scotland for all our people. Thank you. So a big thank you to the presiding officer. Uh, it is now uh, also a great pleasure to introduce to you Jeremy Balfour, MSP. Uh, Jeremy Balfour is the, the convener of the Parliament's cross-party group on disability. Uh, sadly, Jer Jeremy is also unable to join us today, but he has uh, recorded a message as well, welcoming everyone to the Scottish Parliament. And Jeremy recorded this video in the Parliament recently. We have Jeremy Balfour, I hope. Hello, my name is Jeremy Balfour and I'm a member of the Scottish Parliament for Lovians and convener of a cross-party group on disability. I'm sorry I can't be with you in person today, but unfortunately I'm in, currently in hospital recuperating from an operation. I am, however, delighted that so many of you are here today from all over the country, both in the Parliament and online. The cross-party group on disability brings together MSPs, organisations and individuals it looks at ways to ensure that the issues affecting disabled people have a voice in the Scottish Parliament. The cross-party group was where this idea to hold a summit came from. We have been so pleased to partner with the Scottish Parliament in making this event happen. We wanted to give a voice to disabled people across the country. What better way to do that than come to the debating chamber of the Scottish Parliament, right where MSPs sit every week talking about the issues that matter most to the people of Scotland. But today this summit isn't about MSPs, it's about you. We are here today to recognise and celebrate Scotland's diversity, recognising that our differences bring us together, but there's still too many barriers that exist for disabled people, and that needs to change. I hope every single person who participates in the summit today will leave feeling that we've achieved something, that because of this event, we've brought together people, experiences and ideas. I may not be able to be there in person, but I will join online and look forward to hearing the discussion. So, <clears throat> excuse me, also a big thank you to Jeremy Balfour, MSP, and I hope he has a speedy recovery uh, from his operation. So uh, it is now my great pleasure to introduce Dr Jim Elder Woodward, OBE. Jim is convener of Inclusion Scotland and uh, is a long-term disabled activist. Jim was born with cerebral palsy and has lifelong experience of disability, not only as a health and social service user, but also as a service provider, planner and researcher. Jim will in fact read the introduction and his friend and colleague Etienne Dabouville will read the rest of the speech. And can I ask you both for awareness of those attendees who may be visually impaired to please also describe yourselves before opening your speech. So I call on Dr Jim Elder Woodward 
and Etienne Dabouville. Gentlemen. with a grey hair and a grey beard. <laughs> and my, my, my next job is Santa Claus and uh, Harold's shopping centre. Um, Deputy Presiding Officer, may I thank you for agreeing to host the first summit here in the Scottish Parliament celebrating the United Nations International Day of People with Disabilities. May I also thank Jeremy Bobber and Bam Duncan Grant, the convener and deputy convener of the Cross Party Group on Disability, as they start with their brainchild. My thanks also extend to all the organizations, both of and for disabled people present at today's summit, I look forward keenly to their active participation. Also, my thanks go to the many MSPs for their support, not just for their, this event, but for the many hours they spend in the local surgeries supporting disabled people to gain the goods and services they require to participate in society as equal citizens. Finally, I would like to thank the parliamentary staff, without his hard work behind the scenes today will not have been possible. To aid the understanding of my speech, I have asked my good friend and colleague for many, many years, Eddie and Dabble, to read it for me. Hi, everybody. Um, I'm a 25-year-old male bodybuilder. Uh, no, sorry. I'm, I'm, I'm also a 66-year-old wheelchair user, uh, somewhat grey around the edges, and uh, uh, here to read Jim's speech. As you know, December the 3rd, the International Day of People with Disabilities, was first proclaimed in 1992 by the United Nations General Assembly Resolution 47-3. This annual day of observation aims to promote an understanding of disability issues and mobilize support for the dignity, rights, and well-being of disabled people. It also seeks to increase awareness of gains to be derived from the integration of disabled people in every aspect of political, social, economic, and cultural life. The theme of the 2023 celebrations is transformative solutions for inclusive development, the role of innovation 
in fueling an accessible and equitable world. It is 31 years since the first International Disabled People's Day. A disabled child born that day, the 3rd of December 1992, will be a 31-year-old adult this year. Today, we reflect on the world they were born into and the world they now inhabit. There is little doubt that we are living in increasingly troubled times, with the headlines dominated by the millions around the world suffering the impact of geopolitical conflicts, extreme climate events, and the fallout from a dysfunctional global economy. Against that backdrop, it may be tempting to divert our attention away from the very real day-to-day -day experience of many of our own citizens, including those who are disabled. However, before we turn a little closer to home, it is important for us to remember that it is often disabled people who are victims of war, displaced by climate crises, and who bear the brunt when the cost of living rises. We cannot reflect today on our achievements and the challenges facing us without also reflecting on that. And so I'd ask that we take a moment to think of our disabled sisters and brothers worldwide and send a message today that they are in our thoughts. Their fight is our fight. Recognising our global struggle is important today more so than ever. But whilst we reflect on that for a moment, we must also remember where Eleanor Roosevelt reminded us that human rights always start in small places close to home. The values and principles of equality and social justice we hold so dear become more than rhetoric for disabled people in Scotland when we do that, when we keep a relentless focus on their experiences and value here as well as abroad. And so I believe the UN's agenda is as relevant to us today in Scotland as it was 31 years ago. Friends, there has indeed been much to celebrate here in Scotland, which we can relate to the objective of this year's celebration of transformative solutions for inclusive development. Let us be clear from the outset, however, that such development cannot simply be about achieving inclusive outcomes. It must also mean that disabled people have been fully involved in the decision-making process from the very outset. That is why what we are doing today, elevating our voices and our rights to the Chamber of our nation's parliament, is so important. The value of being in this chamber cannot be underestimated, because as you all know very well, there are far too many rooms without us. If, as disabled people in Scotland, we can be grateful for living in a relatively peaceful part of the world, we must also thank our lucky stars. We live in Scotland, where over the years successive governments have largely sought to enhance our rights. In 2009, the UK Government ratified the UN Convention on the Rights of People with Disabilities, which sets our agenda firmly as one of emancipation and human rights. Since then, the introduction of working tax credits supported many disabled people to get back to work, and the Equality Act enshrined our rights to be treated equally in domestic law. Here in Scotland in 2013, we saw the Self-Directed Support Act give us a right to direct our own care. More recently, the Feely Report engaged with our movement and took on our asks for a renewed service, care service in Scotland. We are especially delighted that the Scottish Government also accepted Feely's recommendation to reopen the Independent Living Fund in Scotland to disabled people desperate for support. None of this would have happened without the strength of our movement and, yes, a considerable amount of blood, sweat and tears. Although we are here to celebrate the International Day of People with Disabilities by congratulating ourselves on our joint achievements since 1992, there is still much to do before disabled people in Scotland can say they are truly equal citizens within a welcoming and fully accepting society. Amongst the many barriers of which we must acknowledge, care charges push us into poverty, lock us out of the care and support we need. Inaccessible transport means we can't move freely around our community or country. Many of us find ourselves trapped in hospitals or other institutions, unable to find suitable accommodation, or trapped in inaccessible and often dilapidated houses, sometimes even unable to access basic amenities such as a bathroom or kitchen. We face higher costs 
and on average we have lower incomes. We make up more than half of households experiencing food insecurity. Three quarters of people referred to food banks say they, or a member of their household, are disabled. We meet with barriers to education, particularly higher education. We suffer the, from the rise in hate crime and the public perception that we are just lazy scroungers on state benefits, while the many barriers within the labour market continue to inhibit our participation. Indeed, those of us who rely on state benefits have found such support dwindling, of, dwindling at a substantial rate. These challenges we face as a group have been called a human catastrophe by the UN Committee on the Convention of the Rights of People with Disabilities. And our politicians should heed this today, tomorrow, and every day thereafter. But despite all of these consider considerable challenges, we have shifted the dial, we have pushed open doors, and we have changed laws. Yes, we're still too often left out of rooms, but unlike 30 years ago, when few noticed we were locked out, now, when it happens, it is more likely to be raised in Parliament. Indeed, the UN recognised this in their report, commending the Scottish Government and Parliament for involving disabled people and their directly accountable organisations in their decision-making. Our political representatives can't ignore us anymore. There are too many of us out there, and there are more of us in here, but not enough yet. Perhaps the strongest example of this is seen in the initiative that developed the shared vision of independent living, co-produced in 2009 and revisited in 2013. This joint statement was signed by the Scottish Government, the Scottish NHS, COSLA and the Disabled People's Movement. It set out our agreed vision based on the core principles of independent living, choice, control, freedom and dignity. The vision also saw disabled people across Scotland having equality of opportunity at home and work, in education and in the social, cultural and civic life of the community. In principle, this shared vision became the kernel of the Social Care Self-Directed Support Scotland Act of 2013. And in seeking to extend the reach of our innovative solutions to disability equality, we can do no better than place this vision at the very heart of all Scottish public policy on disability matters. And in 2015, when the UK-wide Independent Living Fund closed, the Scottish Government could have taken the easy option of dispersing the apportioned funding to local authorities, as happened in England and Wales. Instead, and to their credit, they listened to disabled people's call to retain this vital and, in its time, genuinely innovative resource. And so the creation of the ILF in Scotland and its reopening could easily be said to be a prime example of transformative solutions for inclusive development. Such solutions can also be found when disabled people's organisations are funded to develop and manage innovative projects. These wins don't come by accident. We need to engineer them by design. Governments must recognise the value of our individual and collective aims and support us to organise and contribute. A great example of a project run by disabled people and their organisation is the first Scottish parliamentary internship for disabled people, where disabled people develop their employment skills in the very place in which we are sitting today. Other internships supported by the Scottish Government include schemes to enter the public and third sector labour market operated by Inclusion Scotland and the Glasgow Centre for Inclusive Living's Professional Careers Programme, which has provided a gateway for disabled graduates to enter the National Health Service. Now, colleagues, I don't want to be accused of going soft. And so I will also remind us that whilst there have been significant gains, there is still so much to do and no room for complacency. We should not take the grant for granted the wins we've had. We have to keep up the fight. In social care, this is key. We welcome the idea first advocated by Derek Feely's Independent Living Review of Adult Social Care of ethical commissioning. But we also know that the present competitive system of commissioning and procuring social care provision is, unlike, is unfair in relation to smaller third sector organisations which don't have the size to accommodate overheads. 
This is even so for disabled people's peer support organisations, such as those mentioned earlier. Despite the success of those groups, supported by the Scottish Government, there continues to be an underfunding, particularly at the local level, of peer support organisations. As far back as the Cabinet Office report of 2005, their value was recognised in a high-level policy paper from the Prime Minister's Strategy Unit, Improving the Life Chances of Disabled People. It recommended that by 2025, there should be peer support organisations called Centres for Independent Living within each local authority. We are far from realising that recommendation. And if such a competitive system remains within the new National Care Service, even if wearing an ethical hat, the chances of developing our own national network peer support organisations run by disabled people recedes even further. After hearing from a former Director of Social Work that we can't afford your human rights, it is heartwarming to hear that the new National Care Service will adopt a human rights-based approach. We in the Disabled People's Movement are also heartened to hear that the service will be co-designed with people with lived experience of receiving social care support. The development of the Social Covenant Steering Group, the People-Led Policy Panel and the Lived Ex Experience Experts Panel all indicate the Scottish Government's commitment to co-design the service with those who historically have been ignored in the development of their social care support. Genuinely transformational solutions require vision and strong leadership, as they are often more likely to encounter opposition from vested interests than simply following traditional, albeit discredited, ways forward. Social care support is so crucial to the development of disabled people's duty and responsibility to exercise their citizenship that it is essential we are included in the transformational solution to historic differences of the present broken system. The duly accountable disabled people's movement, of which we are all part, are mindful of the range of stakeholders who have genuine concerns over the development of the National Care Service. But we must find a way to ensure the knowledge and experience of disabled people influences the decisions on this too. And to do that, we need our people in the room. May I direct Parliament's attention to Article 29B of the UN's Convention on the Rights of People with Disabilities. This requires states to, and I quote, promote actively an environment in which persons with disabilities can effectively and fully participate in the conduct of public affairs and encourage participation in public affairs, including by forming and joining organisations of persons with disabilities to represent persons with disabilities at international, national, regional and local levels. The Disabled People's Movement is a social movement that is one outside the party political domain, which views society from a different, critical perspective, redefines the issues and develops more appropriate solutions. Not only have we criticised the present system, we see our disability not as a, res as a result of our impairments, but as, as a result of a society which creates barriers to our physical, social, economic, civil and cultural participation. Finally, we have developed our own system of peer support. This, that is why we view our full and active participation in matters affecting our lives as so important to us. Our mantra is, nothing about us without us. That is why we say we are not the object of social care support, we are the subject of it. Our agency within our own lives and that of our family and community must be acknowledged and respected. Nor are we simply the widgets in an industry known as the care sector that is designed and managed in the interests of those who control it. A universal and equitable system of provision must be realised. Presiding officer, in closing, this parliament and government has already put in place considerable efforts to facilitate inclusive development, but it has done so because of the strength of our movement. There is still much to do, and it is vital that we keep on doing until we have achieved our aims. Today, we meet for the first time in this place to celebrate the wins we've had 
and to stand together ready for the fights we've yet to win. I hope it will be the first of many more such occasions and, th and that it will result in more tangible, meaningful action to improve disabled people's lives. In seizing this opportunity today, I also hope we can keep the goal of our human rights and the transformation required to achieve them at the forefront of both our words and our deeds. I do believe if we have the courage and ambition to build on and develop genuinely transformative solutions throughout the forthcoming years, Scotland can become the beacon of that final objective of the theme of this year's UN Day, People with Disabilities, an accessible and equitable world. Thank you to Jim and to Etienne for a very comprehensive and powerful contribution. And I would now like to introduce to you our next speaker, who is Baroness Grey Thompson, DBE. And Baroness Thompson, Grey Thompson will be joining us online today. Aged 17, Tani, as she is known, became part of the British wheelchair racing squad and went on to win an incredible tally of gold, silver and bronze medals, both as a para-Olympic and world champion athlete, breaking 30 world records in her sporting career. She is now an independent crossbench peer in the House of Lords, where she uses her experience and knowledge to speak on a range of issues, including disability rights, welfare reform and sport. And when calling Tani to speak, if I could ask her please also to describe herself briefly, uh, as we are all speaking uh, uh, to those uh, for whom there may be a visual impairment in, in place. So I now call uh, Tani to speak to us. Good afternoon, Tani. Uh, good afternoon and uh, thank you, Deputy presiding officer, uh, and thank you to all those who've asked to join uh, you today. Uh, I'm a wheelchair user, although that is not within the frame of uh, the video footage, uh, but it does define much of my life. I have short hair, uh, the colour changes frequently, so I'm quite blonde at the moment, uh, and I'm wearing a purple jumper. So I'm really sorry that I'm not able to be there in person, but today is my husband's uh, 60th birthday, uh, and I normally spend so much time away from home that I thought I should actually spend the birthday with him. But um, you'd probably better not ask him whether he'd prefer me to be uh, here or there, what would be the, the better present. Um, I would like to thank the tech team for making this possible. Uh, a few years ago, we, uh, certainly through the Westminster Parliament, we would never have dreamt of being able to do something like this. Um, and I'd also like to thank uh, Jeremy Balfour and Pam Duncan Clancy and all those disabled people who uh, put themselves in the political sphere and fight for the rights of disabled people. Also to the disabled people's organisations who champion and educate, uh, it's not an easy task uh, to keep going. Uh, and I'm gonna start by saying, you know, one thing I think is incredibly important is that the time and experience of disabled people should be valued uh, and paid for. Uh, too often, uh, even now, however far we've come, uh, those voices aren't recognised uh, and I feel a sense of frustration that uh, as much as we in many places are sitting around the table, um, we, we still need uh, voices to be more loudly heard. Now, I'm very conscious that I'm Welsh, uh, I'm based and work mostly in England and Wales, uh, but today I'm going to talk about things which are a personal perspective and many of the challenges I'm going to talk about will be very familiar. Uh, I also work a lot in sport, which is subject to devolution. Uh, so some areas uh, I work are, are based just England and Wales and, and some are across the UK. I do think it's important um, as we look forward that we also look back to see how far we've come and every disabled person experience of disability is different, but I must recognise that I've had extraordinary privilege in my life, both as an athlete and a parliamentarian. And key to both those careers uh, was my right to a good education. Now I'm 54, 
I was born with spina bifida. I could walk not very well, uh, but I could walk when I started school. And gradually I became paralysed because my spine collapsed and my vertebra severed my spinal cord. And at that point, I should have been sent to special school. But my head teacher very quickly realised that that would not provide me with a decent education. And my parents recognised it wouldn't give me an education that would allow me to have uh, an independent life. Um, a few years ago, my father was very ill. I knew we didn't have much time left. And I wanted to say thank you to him. Uh, and he did point out that one of the reasons he encouraged me so strongly to think about my education was apparently I was an annoying child and he didn't want me living at home forever. Um, but I was very lucky that my parents used the work of Mary, Baroness Warnock, uh, and basically threatened to sue the Secretary of State for Wales over my right to go to mainstream school. And that changed my life because it enabled me to start playing sports. It got me an education which led me to university. So I did study for a degree in politics and social administration, uh, but swore that uh, this would never be my career path. Um, but I have to say, uh, another privilege for me was 30 years on from uh, that moment. I had been elevated to the House of Lords. I was in a debate tabled by Baroness Warnock, and I was able to tell her uh, in the chamber what her work had meant to me and how much uh, it had changed my life. Um, so from the age of nine or ten, I started to recognise that actually, you know, the role of parliaments are really important. Now, we could have a whole debate on the rights and wrongs of the appointment system uh, for the House of Lords, but one of the strengths does mean that there are a number of disabled people there who are able to contribute uh, to legislation. The other thing was travelling the world gave me an insight into how disabled people were treated in different jurisdictions around the world. And that had a profound effect on me. Uh, and actually that led to, to my career in politics. So I'm treated three very distinct ways. One is an ex-athlete, which is generally quite nice. Uh, one is a parliamentarian. People like me or don't like me for the work that I do. And then as a disabled woman, which is where I experience all the discrimination I face, which is uh, definitely weekly and sometimes daily. So um, I was five when the first person stopped me in the streets and asked me why my parents hadn't aborted me. Uh, my daughter, who's now 21, um, I was told numerous times that people like me shouldn't be allowed to have children. Uh, and it is hard to take that when they're absolutely referring to my impairments. Uh, the skills and the resilience I've developed over the years is that when I'm told things like that, my response is usually what Welsh people aren't allowed to have children. Uh, it actually just stops me being very rude because I do believe it is part of our duty to try and educate people to understand the, the challenges uh, that disabled people face, but also how important it is for disabled people to be uh, included in society. And if I look back to my 20s, I really thought that some of the things that we were fighting for then would have been done by now. Um, there have been some changes, but it's still slow. So in my 20s, I sat on the National Disability Council, which oversaw the implementation of the Disability Discrimination Act. And I remember back then talking about public transport and specifically trains. And the date of January the 1st, 2020 was given when all trains were meant to be step free. Uh, and that felt like a lifetime away. Um, and I thought, Number one, by that age, I'm going to be really old. But I just thought, why on earth was it going to take that long? Uh, January the 1st, 2020 came and went, and it's now going to be 2070 before I can get on a train without the permission or support of a non-disabled person. Um, so it shouldn't shock me that, you know, that we change is slow, but it does inspire me and encourage me uh, to keep going keep fighting for that change. Now, my background in sport opened my eyes to so many things, and it was back in 2000 that Nelson Mandela said, sport has the power to change the world. It has the power to do many incredible things. I was involved in bidding for the 2012 Olympics and Paralympics and also game delivery, involved in lots of different parts of sport. Um, but my frustration really is when people tell me that 2012 changed the world for disabled people. It was an incredible sporting moment. It highlighted some issues, uh, but it certainly didn't change the world. 
Um, and I think as we move forward, sport is still a very powerful tool. You look at the Manchester Commonwealth Games, uh, the Glasgow Commonwealth Games um, and the World Cycling that's just taken place. Really important opportunities to champion uh, inclusion and, and open in the world's eyes. But we can't, nor should we expect, a 10 days of a Paralympic Games uh, to change the world on its own. And we shouldn't uh, let people uh, get away with thinking that if we have some great sporting events, then we don't have to do anything else. And I think we do have to be very careful that we don't slip further into inspiration porn in terms of how we cover disability sport. There are some amazing moments, uh, and uh, sport is a complication to inspiration porn. But also, you know, we shouldn't be talking about people's impairment as they're actually competing. And that, in some ways, is, is some of the fear I've got, that sometimes it feels like we're moving slightly backwards uh, in, in those moments. So some of the areas that I work on uh, are very varied. Um, media representation is one of those areas. So growing up, I didn't really see many disabled people. Uh, I saw on TV Sandy Richardson from Crossroads, uh, you'll have to be a similar age to me to remember that, uh, and Ironside. And I knew they weren't disabled people, they were just actors. So in many ways, um, I wasn't constrained by the lack of uh, disability that I saw around me. I know we'll, we'll have achieved a lot in media representation um, when there is more than six degree, degrees of separation between somebody I see on TV who's a disabled person and me. I think the most I've got to now, uh, if I see a disabled person presenting, um, I, I don't have to make more than two phone calls to get in touch with them, and that means that we're not where we should be. I still do a lot of work on education. Um, I receive emails weekly um, from families who are struggling to get the appropriate educational uh, support for disabled children. And I also work um, in employment in terms of um, really challenging the fact that, you know, we still have, you know, 50% of disabled people who can be in work across the UK are able to. Um, that's just not good enough. It, it really isn't for where we need to be. And I'm also conscious that, you know, if we look back at, at COVID um, and the impact that that had on disabled people, um, it's been devastating either the number of people uh, who died with a, a learning disability or the number of people who had do not attempt resuscitation orders put on them without their knowledge or permission. Um, I had several friends who that happened to them. And that is really worrying that I thought that would be the moment that British society would, would wake up and say, this, this is not good enough, but that moment passed. Some of the other areas that I work on, and I know this is a very controversial area, is uh, I'm not in favour of changing the law on assisted suicide. Uh, I'm not religious, I'm, I'm, I'm an agnostic atheist. But I do worry in a time where there are still so many challenges around including disabled people, um, that they will be encouraged, pushed, moved to believe in that their life has no value and if they don't get the support they need, they see this uh, not as a choice, but the only way forward. And a really stark moment was uh, relatively recently reading uh, about Christine Gauthier in Canada, who uh, is a veteran, Paralympian. Uh, she'd had a five-year battle to get a ramp for her house, and Veteran Affairs said that they wouldn't help support that financially, but they would give her the drugs to end her life. Uh, and that makes me worried about how disabled people are still per perceived. Uh, I feel strongly about it. Does it affect me right now? No, but I have a lot of privilege with my life in the Lords uh, and my family. It offers me a level of protection, but that's a level of protection I don't think uh, many disabled people uh, have as, as, as they should have. The other area I work really extensively on is public transport, EV charging. Um, if we can't get EV chargers to be accessible for disabled people, uh, I'm not sure what we're actually doing. Um, and apologies to anybody who follows me on Twitter. Um, I only tweet about trains uh, and our lack of access. Uh, and if you ever see uh, somebody send me a picture of a gremlin on my, my social media feed, uh, that is my sister telling me I need to stop because I'm being annoying. But uh, um, we don't have time to talk about the summer campaign for ticket office closures. Uh, I have to say Scotland was, was protected from that, thank goodness. 
But we're at a point in our life where um, turn up and go as a legal right is being severely threatened uh, by cuts and by challenges. Uh, and that's something uh, that we need to, to keep fighting for. Um, I'm extremely worried that we're being forced into a booking system that non-disabled people uh, don't have to, to utilise uh, where we have to book. We're not going to be allowed to travel by train unless we book two hours uh, in, in advance. Um, I think that's uh, incredibly negative and is taking us backwards because actually we do have social lives, we do have work, you know, we do have things that we're doing that we can't always base our lives around booking um, two hours in advance. I would briefly like to um, pay tribute again to, to Pam, who um, I'm working with, uh, and her work with Scott Rail and a colleague of mine, Tony Jennings. Uh, we're working very hard to overturn uh, their scooter policy. They've come a very long way. Uh, and that's really exciting when we're able to, to talk to companies who understand the needs of disabled people and actually start looking forward to how we can enable people, disabled people, to do things uh, rather than uh, stopping them from doing things. So one thing I say about my uh, desire to travel by train, I just want the same miserable experience as everyone else. I don't yet have it. I'm not arguing for special treatment. I'm not arguing for a red carpet everywhere I go. I just want the same treatment as everyone else. And, and that's the thing that keeps me going every day. Um, I'm very conscious uh, the only thing between you and a comfort break is my end of my speech. So I'm going to just sum up very quickly uh, and just say uh, I'm very privileged. I have amazing uh, disabled colleagues around me. Uh, a lot of amazing non-disabled colleagues who believe in the fight for equality and are doing everything that we can. And it's really important to have events like this, uh, to be able to connect and to be able to learn from each other, to be challenged, really happy for you to challenge me on anything I've said. Um, you can find my email address on the Westminster Parliamentary System. Really happy to be connected to anybody. Uh, but in moments like this, we have a chance to change things. Uh, and I would like to get on a train uh, some point before I die without the permission or support of a non-disabled person. Uh, so thank you very much. Uh, thank you for allowing me to, to dial in today. And with that, I'd like to hand back to the Deputy Presiding Officer. Thank you very much. Thank you, Tani, uh, for your thought-provoking and hugely inspiring contribution. And I'm sure we all wish... Tani's husband, a very happy uh, 60th birthday. And with that, I would like now to announce a, a short 15-minute uh, comfort break. And the event uh, assistants will direct you to the nearest facilities. And I therefore suspend, uh, for broadcasting purposes, this part of the plenary session. Thank you. The Scottish Parliament adjourned on the 25th day of March in the year 1707 is hereby reconvened. <laughs>
Designed by lead architect Enrique Morales, the building opened in 2004. Morales took inspiration for his design from Scotland's natural environment, its landscapes and its strong connection to the sea. He described the building as growing out of the land. This Parliament of Scotland may be a modern day Parliament and a modern day building, but the story of a Parliament in Scotland goes back much further. We can date a Parliament in Scotland all the way back to the year 1235. The Canongate was once home to the gentry of Edinburgh, the landowners, the traders and nobles of the day. However, over the centuries it has seen many changes. This era slowly declined and eventually became home to those less fortunate. The one constant throughout the years has been this building, Queensbury House. A 17th century townhouse, once home to James Douglas, the second Duke of Queensbury and member of Scotland's old parliament. It now forms a working part of this new parliament's campus. The grand old doors of Queensbury House. This door is usually reserved for the likes of His Majesty the King, but it once welcomed people from a very different walk of life. Though Queensbury House began its life as a grand home, by the 1950s it had long served Edinburgh as a care home for the elderly poor and later a hospital. You see the important role that this building served in supporting those most in need in this letter penned by an anonymous author who remembers the importance of Queensbury House well. My mind goes back to 1912. By the well there's a crowd of private customers waiting for their dinner near the door. In the queue, there's a girl of 12 years. By her bare feet stands a huge pot. She's clutching a penny and hopes it won't be long before opening time. In her home, her seven brothers and sisters are waiting. Her father lost heart and died. There are some baleful looks from the private customers, the huge iron pot being the object of their comments. At last, the door opens. She explains she wants it filled up. The assistant, though busy, carries it out. She drags it round the corner where her sister is hiding. There's no talk at first, but as hunger is appeased, they all vote that's a lovely place they found. The doors of Queensbury House as a hospital closed in 1996. The ghost of its halls left in silence to wander, though not for long. It was acquired in 1997 to serve the people of Scotland once again, the home of the new Scottish Parliament. Today's Parliament Garden is based on a traditional knot garden. This more traditional style is in complete contrast with the modern architecture around it. But just as Queensbury House itself has merged into the Parliament campus, past and present come together here too. It contains traditional box hedges as well as a row of apple and pear trees located exactly where the Duke of Queensbury would have had his 17th century orchard. With the spectacular backdrop of Salisbury Crags and extinct volcano Arthur's Seat, the garden brings some tranquility to this very busy building. The Parliament is very conscious of its place in the landscape and the contribution it can make to the environment around it. As well as planting a variety of Scottish wildflowers in our gardens, we also have beehives on site. The bees and the beehives are looked after by a local business. And what is really something quite special is that the beeswax produced by the bees has been used to fill the Great Seal of Scotland. This is the Royal Seal that has been placed upon every act passed by the Scottish Parliament since it started in 1999. The bees, therefore, have a very important role to play in the lawmaking process and the Scottish Parliament's circle of life. Now, from our garden to our garden lobby. We've taken a little inspiration from the bees as this is a hive of activity. Much like a beehive, a whole world in miniature exists within these walls and everyone has their part to play. We have everything we need to enable our work within the building. Post office, cash machine, gym, coffee bar and more. This space may look familiar as it's the area often used for filming interviews. It is always centre stage regardless of what's taking place. The imposing stairs are a landscape for groups and organisations to stand proudly within when meeting their representatives. Like a great circulatory system which connects all of the different areas together, the garden lobby enables the movement of staff throughout. This is the path members take when they make an important journey. 
the road to creating laws. Recognise this room? This is the beating heart of the Parliament. The debating chamber, or Shomer Jezbich, is the meeting place where our representatives come together to engage and speak with passion about the matters affecting everyday life here in Scotland. Our team of broadcasting engineers work tirelessly to turn these impassioned exchanges into transmissions, viewed all over the world. From this, our sound booth, we ensure that not one word is missed, and with over 130 microphones, we miss nothing. Within the walls of our broadcasting suite, we convert material from across eight cameras into a stream of content, delivering to the people of Scotland the latest political news as it happens. Hakor is un Hanan in Shaw. Did it catch that? Well, I was saying there's more than one language here. Some of our proceedings are translated into Gaelic or British Sign Language. We have specialised interpretation booths so that the words you hear are the words you want to hear or see. From the central platform, our presiding officer oversees it all, with a vision for the Parliament and the authority to bring it all to a conclusion. So I guess that's the end, but just for today. Tomorrow we pick it up all over again. The Scottish Parliament is a turning wheel driving us down a long and winding road, aiming towards a better future and a better destination. My name is Deborah Desara and I'm the Recruitment and Talent Management Partner and I strategically lead Recruitment and Talent Management at the Scottish Parliament. As an organisation we're diverse, inclusive, welcoming and respectful and there's always a lot going on for staff to get involved with. Our strategic objectives and our work are based on our values of stewardship, excellence, respect and inclusiveness. Our values are embedded in our roles and in the way we treat each other and they're championed throughout the organisation. So why work at the Parliament? Well, we have flexible and hybrid working as standard and we're an inclusive workplace. We don't have a one-size-fits-all approach. We cater for individual needs. We have progressive and inclusive workplace policies and a focus on sustainability. We have a culture of respect and inclusion and everyone has the ability to make a difference. We carry out yearly pay benchmarking and we work in partnership with the trades unions to ensure that our pay remains competitive. We're a supportive employer and we help all our colleagues to develop further skills and we have high internal mobility. We use positive action in recruitment and where we have groups that are underrepresented, we ask these candidates to also apply to our roles. I'd really encourage anyone from a minority ethnic background and anyone with any disabilities to apply to our jobs. We're a disability confident employer and if disabled candidates meet the minimum criteria for any role, we'll invite them for an interview. All in all, we're a diverse staff group across the whole of Parliament and I really enjoy working here.
I love the Parliament building, and too many people have never been in it. This building is fascinating. It's very open and inviting. Things are really open and transparent here. Uh, not with just the design of the building, but the way that uh, business is handled. I just went from a very negative opinion of it to a very positive opinion. So I think it's lovely. The light that comes through, I think the light is amazing. I thought the tour was fabulous. The young man that took it was very enthusiastic and he um, gave us an insight into the, what the architect was thinking. I think it's, it's a welcoming place, it's very friendly, it's got a lovely feel to it. It's nice, I didn't know what to expect and I was pleasantly surprised. And certainly for the members of uh, Parliament to be able to share this with all the people from Scotland and around the world. Very, very unique uh, architecture and a very neat tour. It's fascinating. It's our country. It's our parliament. Be proud of it. Can everybody hear me? Excellent. So welcome back uh, to our plenary session and we will now move into a question and answer session with our panel of cross-party MSPs and councillors. So I'll introduce them and then perhaps we could offer them a nice welcome at this stage. And our first panellist is Emma Roddick, MSP, Scottish National Party. And Emma is the Scottish Government Minister for Equalities, Migration and Refugees. 
and Emma is joining us online this afternoon. We then have Councillor John Denerly, Scottish Conservative and Unionist Party, and John has an assigned BSL interpreter. Uh, and then we have Pam Duncan Glancy, MSP, who I'm sure you all know, uh, Scottish Labour Party. And then we have Julian Mackay, MSP, Scottish Green Party. And then we have Councillor Alan Knox, Scottish Liberal Democrats. So perhaps we could give them a nice, warm welcome. So before I open up the actual question and answer session, I would like to ask each of our panellists to briefly describe themselves for the awareness of attendees with any visual impairment, and then also to tell us about their journey into politics and two or three minutes maximum, please. And I first call Emma Roddick. Ms Roddick. Thank you, Presiding Officer, and hello, everyone. Um, as you've heard, my name is Emma Roddick, um, Minister for Equalities, also MSP for the Highlands and Islands. I have brown hair, brown eyes, uh, I'm white, and I'm wearing a cream top today. Um, as you may have noticed, I'm online uh, and I look a bit ill. That's because I've just re been recovering from COVID and obviously didn't want to put anybody at risk today, so I'll be attending remotely. Uh, as to how I got into politics, well, I, I worked for an MSP when I was a teenager, uh, decided that politics was absolutely not for me. Um, I thought I thought he was mad to do it, but uh, then I moved out of politics, went to work in the ambulance service for a few years, uh, a by-election was called in my council ward and the retiring councillor said, look, Emma, you need to go for it. So I did, um, got elected, then got elected again in the last parliament elections and here I am, and now a uh, minister as well. So that's, that's my story. Thank you, Emma. And I now call uh, councillor John Dennerly. Hello, everyone. Uh, good afternoon. I am Councillor John D Dernley from the Scottish Conservative and Unionist Group from Dumfries and Galloway. So I am Dumfries and Galloway Council. Myself, I, I became really excited in politics when I was 15 years old. I remember being in school and I would have to stand up for elections within the, the schoolyards. From that was like in 1983, I remember Margaret Thatcher coming into power. Uh, that I was uh, I was uh, for 11 years, and I remember being completely, completely happy to be following along with her rules. And I moved into Dumfries and Galloway about 20 years ago because of um, a business programme that I was working on. So I've been working with through all of that with um, the social work and been really involved in that the local government elections for a good few years now, and I was the first deaf um, um, Conservative to be elected in the whole of the UK. So I am very, very proud of that achievement for being elected as the first deaf Conservative. So that perspective has really, I'm really focused on inclusion and accessibility within politics and the political landscape. And if I'm, I'm one of 16 Conservatives that were voted into the Dumfries and Galloway um, through different elections and the variety of different people within our committee. So we have monthly discussions in terms of we have we convened through the Scottish Councils and also for the deaf. So back in 2021 and 20, sorry, back in 2016, I was the representation of the Cross Party Group for um, deafness, and that, that was the last time I was involved. So I have been working with um, a, a working group. Regularly, we're building to become the first and achieve the BSL Act 2015. So I was involved in all of the working groups leading up to that point. So, and then I've been founding the active, active groups for the disabled participation. And so recently I've been working with Germany, Germany Balfour, um, one on one, we've been included in a lot of discussions with him recently. So we have the summer elective panels and the research from the, the government of zoology. zoology. So the, the, the RZSS so was the first um, hard of hearing and deaf person within that panel as well for over 150 years. So I was the first on that panel too. Thank you. And I now call on Pam Duncan Glancy, MSP. 
Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. My name is Pam Duncan Glancy. I represent the Scottish Labour Party for the region of Glasgow, and I'm also our shadow spokesperson on education. I'm a wheelchair user. I'm about four foot six. Um, my hair is purple today. Sometimes it's, it depends how washed out it is since I've washed it, but um, it's relatively deep purple today. I'm wearing a black and white dress and a black suit jacket. I got into politics um, largely actually through student politics when I went to Stirling University um, in around 2000. I was in the atrium um, in the university and somebody called Kelly Curran, who um, I know some of you will know well, um, an incredible woman who I've since met in various different guises um, since I first met her at university, approached me and said, the Student Representative Council, so it was Stirling University Students Association, need a disabled persons rep do you fancy it? You look like you fit the bill. <laughs> to which I said, well done, decent observation skills there. Um, I, I'm, I'm just here to get my, my degree and, and, and that's it. And she said, well, come along, give it a chat, give it a, give it a shot. So I went, I went along that night and one of the things that they were discussing was the refit of the student union, a place I frequented relatively regularly for a light lemonade, of course. Um, and... <laughs> When, when they started to discuss the refit, they, they made the point that they were going to um, change the lift and part of the thing they were going to do about changing the lift was to put a key in it. And so I piped up, why, why are you having a key in the lift? Like, are you, does everyone else have to ask for a key to get in the building? And they said, no, but it might be used by other people. And I was like, <laughs> heaven forbid, you know, people should use the lift. Um, so I, I said, you know, I don't think that's the best thing to do and why don't we change that? And so I realised then that I don't think, and this is not any disrespect to anyone else in the room, but I don't think if Kelly or I had, hadn't been in that room, anyone would have raised that point. And it was at that point that I realised it's really, really important to be in the room. I then um, migrated uh, in, into party politics, of course, as I think um, is sometimes the case. I'd say that was by accident, not design. Um, and I joined the Labour Party as a student. I was really inspired by some of the work that was coming out of um, the Prime Minister's strategy unit at the time, and we heard about that this morning, um, on improving life chances of disabled people. And my MP at the time was Anne Maguire, who um, continues to be a hero of mine today. Um, from there, I got my very first job, um, and I'll tell you a bit more about that later, um, but I got my very first job, and it was in the disability movement, and I credit a lot of that to not just allowing me to understand what politics was about, but also allowing me to understand what disability politics was about. And I saw the value in being empowered by living and breathing and being with other disabled people, because only together can you really um, change, change and affect change for disabled people across the world. Um, that kind of got me into equality and human rights. I spent some time in the third sector um, working on equality and human rights. Um, worked for the Equality and Human Rights Commission at one point and then I went into the NHS before getting elected in 2021. Um, I was appointed before I was elected and Asarwar appointed me to Shadow Cabinet. I did say to him, I might lose, like, <laughs> what, what's going to happen? Um, but, but he nonetheless appointed me to that and so I served um, for nearly two years as Shadow um, Cabinet Secretary for Social Justice um, and Social Security, a position um, I very much enjoyed. Um, I was uh, then appointed as the Shadow Cabinet Secretary for Education um, and I absolutely love it because I fundamentally believe that education, when done well, can be the leveller um, that we all need and deserve and I hope to do what I can to make that the case um, in Scotland. Thank you. Thank you, Pam. I now call Gillian Mackay, MSP. Gillian. Thanks, Deputy Presiding Officer. So, uh, my name's Gillian. I have long blonde hair. I'm wearing a cream jumper and black trousers. I ended up in politics entirely by accident. Um, happy accident, though. I really do enjoy um, what I do. I wanted to be a teacher since I was very, very small. My uh, mum talked me out of it, having been a teacher for a long time. Um, told me to go and, and go and get a subject at university behind me. And then if I really still wanted to teach at the end of four years, she wouldn't try and talk me out of it again. Um, I went and did my undergraduate at Heriot Watt and then did my master's in marine biotechnology and biodiversity. And at the time of year when you come out of a, a master's degree, very few people are taking on marine biology graduates for field work in October in Scotland. Um, so I had to look for, for something else. And I have a, a hearing-related impairment. And at that point, 
on a bit of a whim, um, applied for an Inclusion Scotland internship and got it. I wanted to come into this place and see how parliamentarians interacted with legislation and constituents and things, was placed with Alison Johnson, MSP, back in session four, and didn't climb out of the party after that. Um, as many, many a time happens in party politics, you go to a meeting, get volunteered for something, and then end up doing three more things in the subsequent years very, very quickly. Um, so having done various things with the, with the Young Greens, with my branch, I've stood for every level of election possible at one point or another, um, and was elected in 2021. I'm our health, social care and sports spokesperson. Really keen to, to see what we can do within all of those spaces to ensure that disabled people's voices are, are heard. When I first started experiencing um, some of the more challenging symptoms of, of my impairment, my parents were told it was an attention-seeking behaviour and that I'd grow out of it. Um, so knowing that that is a reality for, for many of us, it's something that we need to make, we need to make better across, across the whole. And that's how I've ended up here. Thank you, Gillian. And I now call Councillor Alan Knox. Alan. My name is Councillor Alan Knox. I'm Councillor for Teabridge Headward in Fife. Um, I'm 59, got short, what, red hair. Well, some red hair left, a little bit grey, and I'm wearing a navy blue jacket. Um, when I was 14, I had my first epileptic seizure back in 1978. Um, I went to university around 82, 83, the time of the Thatcher landslide general election. Unlike Pam, I didn't get involved in student politics. I got involved in adults politics, but I, I was mainly the cannon for the delivering leaflets, knocking doors. Um, graduated 87, but back then there was no Disability Discrimination Act, no uh, Equality Act, which meant that when I was applying for jobs as someone who's had epilepsy all their life, there was no requirement to make a reasonable adjustment. So you'd see office jobs advertised that say driving license essential. Um, Continued to be involved in politics and somebody said, do you realise there's a constituency organiser, this, this is in Aberdeen by the way, there's a constituency organiser job going in Lancashire. So I moved down to a town called Clitheroe in Lancashire in England. Um, and worked as a constituency organiser, getting lots of people elected. And then on the 1st of May 1997, when there was a Blair landslide, I stood and got elected to council. So there's a little bit of parallel that the day that the that legislation that came to make this building come to pass was the day I first got elected. Um, got elected as a councillor, was councillor down there for 24 years, continued to get other people elected. In fact, one of the proudest things that, that happened to me was not being made mayor of Clitheroe myself, but someday I got elected um, a guy called Simon, who was a wheelchair user, um, not only getting him elected, but the day he became mayor, uh, that, that really made me feel chuffed. Um, just as COVID was coming along, my wife and I had always had an inkling to retire, or at least semi-retire in St Andrews. Um, we didn't know COVID was coming, but we decided to relocate anyway. We, we arrived in St Andrews on the day of lockdown, um, and within a year, I, I was being persuaded by a certain Mr Rennie to stand for Teabridge Head Warden 5. And thank you to all our panellists for sharing their journeys into politics with us. So we will now move on to the questions that have been submitted by you via the Slido app uh, that we had asked everyone attending, both in person and in online, to install and use today. Um, what I would say is you can continue to submit your questions 
Uh, and you can also vote for a question you like. You can ask a question anonymously or can choose to add your first name only, and that will be fine. Um, we actually have already received a number of questions, and we don't have endless time in this particular session, but I will try to get to as many questions as possible, and as I say every day in the Chamber. To facilitate that end, I would seek also succinct um, responses from our <laughs> panellists. Um, questions that we don't reach, um, in fact, Pam Duncan Glancy is hosting an online uh, um, uh, sort of wrap up um, post summit uh, discussion uh, after this session this afternoon. So that would perhaps afford an opportunity if there are a lot of questions that have been posed but we haven't had time to get to, to be aired at that point. Um, most of the questions I'll ask all the panellists to contribute. Some of the questions I'll direct to a specific uh, panellist or panellists, plural. So the first question has got two elements, and it's really picking up from the fantastic speeches we heard earlier today from Jim and from Tani. And a, a key point that Jim made was that the, the need to have uh, disabled people being fully involved in the decision-making process and that people with disabilities are actually in the room or in the many rooms uh, that, where decisions are made. And it, it would be to, to seek views from the panellists as to whether they feel that is at all being achieved, that disabled people are, with people with disabilities are actually in the rooms they need to be in. And linked with that, Tani had made the point that um, she is, is notices she's treated in, in, in various ways. So as an athlete or an ex-athlete, as a parliamentarian, she feels she's uh, treated in a particular way, but as a disabled woman, uh, she experiences uh, discrimination. And the question would be, does that in fact surprise anyone? And that would be a question for the panelists to consider. So the, being in the room, are people with disabilities in the room? And does it surprise anyone that somebody like Tani would say, nonetheless, in all her achievements, she is still uh, treated uh, as a disabled woman uh, in terms of the discrimination she uh, suffers? So perhaps I'll just start with, on my left, Gillian, you start. So in relation to the points from Tani, I'm not surprised, and I don't think any of the panel will be surprised, or anyone actually in the audience, given all of our experiences um, of our own impairments. I think that's something we need to continue to challenge and actually I found um, Tani's comments on, on the way that she challenges that pretty typical actually of I'm sure the way many of us try to deal with that is with is with some form of, of humour and trying to and trying to brush it off. But it is a really it's a really serious point and something that we need to continually um, challenge when it when it does come up. In terms of people being in the room, I think it's done more than it was previously. There's also a question of how well it's done. I sit on the, the Health and, and Social Care Committee and we've been scrutinising the National Care Service legislation and one of the questions that I asked um, Derek Feely was around uh, the co-design and the participation of um, disabled people in this work because it's a lot to ask of people to continually contribute to the many, many strands of work that are going on and actually making that contribution meaningful but also sustainable for everyone so that we're not being detrimental to anybody's health and well-being in asking them to contribute, I think is, is really important. It's something we need to continue to evolve and actually take that feedback as to how people would like to be involved, I think is, is really important as well, because as some of the earlier panellists said too, everybody's experience of their own impairment is, and the barriers that are put up to that impairment are different. And we need to recognise that within those engagement activities that we do. Thank you, Gillian. Uh, I would next go to Alan. I think one of the things that, I mean, obviously things have improved, but I think one of the things that is actually helping is that the more disabled people in the room, the more they educate the rest of the room, so that when the rest of the room goes out into a different meeting, they can then advocate for disabled people as well. So I, I think that there, there is a sort of, almost a snowball effect that it is helping spread it out and it's not just coming back in the same people time and time again, because that then puts a lot of pressure on, as Gillian said, those people with disabilities. Thank 
you for that. Um, Emma, your thoughts? Yeah, I mean, I would say, first of all, yeah, there are disabled people in the room. I mean, I'm in this chamber quite a lot with with Gillian and Pam and, and some other disabled colleagues. And no, it's not surprising uh, the the context that's been laid out because it is tough. You know, I, I faced uh, a lot of challenges uh, as a disabled MSP, particularly in the beginning, um, getting used to the role, uh, facing some difficult practicalities and also attitudes. Um, that was everything from from people being quite disparaging to you know just being able to get approval to attend virtually like I am right now or get the right equipment. Um, and like like Councillor Knox just said, you know it is easier when there are other disabled people in the room. Um, I leaned quite a lot on Gillian, Palm, Jeremy, and others in the beginning, um, and it, it was good just to well not good like you don't want other people to be going through the same thing but it does you do get a feeling of solidarity and like you're you're not on your own and and there's going to be people sticking up for you when there's others there and i've had similar experiences to pam in in particularly in the beginning realizing that you are that voice in the room that you always assumed would be there and it turns out it's not and you have to go and do it yourself um you know when when i was a counselor i pointed out that there was no lift to uh the, the room that I had to go to meet more business meetings every every month. And they said, well, we don't have any wheelchair users in the council. I said, well, that's not surprising, is it? <laughs> and I think people don't really get that you've got to, to make things accessible if you're going to get diversity of voices. Thank you, Emma. And, and next I would go to John and I would ask John, to, to perhaps focusing on the point that Tani made, that uh, Tani is an ex-athlete of enormous prestige. She is a member of the House of Lords, a crossbencher, and yet she feels that it is her disability that is the focus of people, and indeed in a not helpful, but rather in a discriminatory manner. John, any thoughts on that? Yeah, so I just wanted to introduce a little bit of a description that I forgot. I forgot to do my description of who I was before. I just wanted to let you know that I am tall. Um, I am middle-aged. I've got dark hair. Uh, I've got a grey beard. Mm -hmm. And I use sign language to communicate as I am deaf. So I just wanted to add that in there because I forgot earlier on. So just what with Hani was talking about. Disability in terms of role models. People want to look for a strong voice that can take the lead in terms of, deaf, um, of disabled people. They want, to be in, they want to be involved in that room, but you don't see a lot of people stepping forward out there to be in that room as a disabled person. So when we're talking about like her 30% of disabled people are in Scotland, they're all there. They're there every day, have their own lives, they're having to campaign for their life and the priority to get them into that room as a disabled person. They have their own voices, they've got their own representation, they've got their own political agendas. They need to be in that room and fight every single day to be involved in politics and political matters. So I, rep I here to represent the deaf community, I have role models within our society that we can have empathy with, that we, can, that we understand the experience between ourselves, we understand the barriers that we face every single day because we go through it together. We constantly face these barriers and a lot of people will look at us and go, oh, they're disabled, let's, uh, let's just, uh, we don't really need to worry about them, it'll be fine. But really disability doesn't mean, isn't a medical model. It's not linked to medical, it's not us that have created the barriers, it is society and the councils, the public services need to be responsible to provide that accessibility for everybody, to make sure everyone is included on an equal basis in terms of law and accessibility. So we don't want to have that tokenism of the one person in the room that can represent someone, that's not what we want, so we're having to campaign every day and start through the elective process of like, oh, okay, I've now been elected, great, lovely, that's it. No, now I'm in and there's more barriers within being a councillor that I didn't understand, they didn't understand I needed certain things to be on the same keel as them in terms of communication support. That's been a massive problem. There's not a lot of um, support out there in terms of, they go, okay, we've got a disabled person, we've got someone in a wheelchair, we've got someone who's blind or physically disabled, but they're like, oh, you, why do you need communication support? You've, we've got the access, we gave you a lift. What more could you possibly want? It's, we, they're they're realising that they're making us responsible to have to make the change when it should be everyone in Scotland supporting that accessibility. And through the election pro, um, processes, 
we should be receiving funding to help our councillors and help our public and those with disabilities within the political landscape and impact to have a more positive situation so that means we can have more deaf and disabled role models out there and there's less discrimination less barriers within our group so if we all share our stories and our experiences that's going to move us all forward in a much more positive way thank you um and before turning to pam i perhaps could start i, I read out a, a question we've received which i think would be appropriate to put to pam as well so pam could perhaps give her thoughts on the conversation we've just had but also it was a question from and excuse me if i'm not pronouncing this properly but kirin 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 and the question was what do you feel uh, you'd like to achieve or be achieved for disabled people in the coming year Thank you. Um, I'll come back to that because I'll give myself a bit of time to think about it. Um, so the, the point about um, the importance of being in the room or not, I, I, I genuinely do not think it can be underestimated and we're not in enough rooms. And that goes for everything from school all the way to the high street, to the post office, to the bank, to the workplace. Um, to the pub, to places like this, Parliament Chambers and Council Chambers across the world, and we're not in them. Um, and we're not in them in the numbers that, that we should be. It's one of the reasons, actually, that I'm really passionate about mainstream education, actually, because the point that was made earlier um, by Councillor Knox about you can learn from other people, and you do. You do learn from other people. And if you never go to school with somebody, um, then you might be surprised to also see them in the workplace. Um, and so that's why I think it's really important to be um, in the room. And there's a song in the... the um, stage musical Hamilton for anybody else it's anti musicals um, called um, The Room Where It Happens uh, and it's my favourite um, from that musical because being in the room really does matter a bit like um, I think Emma made the point earlier about you assume someone else will make the point and then you get in there and you go nope they hadn't thought about it um, and actually that happens all the time um, and so it's really really important to have um, more disabled people in the room where it happens and, and this is one of those rooms um, where it happens and sometimes it's about genuinely bringing up these issues and it can be tiring because there aren't that like many of us who get to be in this position to be honest um, so it can be tiring for a few people and I mean everyone in this room as well because I know that we, we've seen each other in various rooms in the past and that's because it can be difficult to 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 be the person that goes out and fights and I remember about six or seven years ago um, uh, an MSP at the time who I won't name said um, god these these issues are terrible that I'm hearing about. I can't believe that's happening to disabled people. Why are they not beating my door down to tell them, to tell me about it as their M MSP? I said, because they can't get out of bed because they don't have any social care. Like, how do you expect people to advocate for their, their rights if they don't have the support to participate in society and lead an ordinary life? So I think that's crucial. Um, on Tani's point about um, identity, I actually think um, as a disabled person, you could, um, and, and I do, um, regularly have a crisis of identity on a daily basis because on one hand you're expected to convince an employer that you can do exactly the same as everyone else and on the other hand you're expected to convince a benefits assessor that you really do need the support that they need you to that that they're going to give you so that's a bit of a crisis of identity and occupy, occupying that space is hard um, and I completely recognize Tani's um, Tani's experience like I, I don't I don't know how often I'm, I've been invited into a room to talk about being a woman it's, it's very, very, it's, it's quite rare, um, but I'm a disabled woman and, and that is as part an important, um, important part of my identity as anything else. Um, and to, to the final question about um, what do I hope is achieved um, for disabled people in, in the next year? I mean, I'll, I'll resist equality, human rights, social justice for all, because um, I feel like that might be a bit ambitious, although I am an optimist. Um, I, I actually think within the next year, um, if, if we could get to a position where social care really was um, on a path to being, being able to deliver um, the, the equality and human rights that disabled people need, that would be essential. And part of that would be about, um, about care charges um, and, and removing care charges. So I, I'm optimistic. Um, and I think if we could do that in a year, that would make a huge impact on the lives of disabled people across Scotland. Thank you, Pam. Uh, so our, our next question, which I would put to Emma and to Gillian, Emma and then Gillian, would be uh, and from different perspectives. The question is uh, both, I think, received from somebody anon anonymously and also from Afira. What is the government doing for people who suffer from autism or dyslexia and cannot get a job? Emma. 
So um, at the moment, my colleagues over in health are working on the um, autism learning difficulties and neurodivergence bill. Um, so that will hopefully help to, to empower people with all the, the various diagnoses within, within that space uh, to recognise their rights and, and be better supported through, through all aspects of life. But um, also over in Fair Work, we're looking at that disability employment gap. Now, I have to be very careful here that because based on what's what's been in the news this week, um, I'm absolutely not going down the route of disabled people must work to have any value as human beings. Um, that is not where we're going, but we do recognise that many disabled people wish to work and currently just aren't getting the support that they need in order to be able to, to do the work that they want to do. So um, we're looking at that from a, a you know, equal human rights perspective, people need to have that opportunity and that support when they make clear what it is that they need in order to enter work. But, you know, you, you are, everybody, whether they're disabled and or not, has the same human rights and the same intrinsic value. Thank you, Emma. Gillian, your thoughts? I think on top of what Emma said in terms of, in terms of, a uh, those initiatives. I think the Autism Learning Disability and Neurodivergence Bill will be really good in terms of hopefully raising um, raising the profile of, of people with those experiences and those um, living with those conditions. Again, keep us honest on that. <laughs> come and speak to us, come and tell us where you don't, things aren't going well, things are going well, because we don't often hear where people actually really like things. <laughs> we hear when things go, go wrong. And actually, we're here as individual MSPs as well. Not everything always needs national policy for us to be able to, to help in individual cases as well. So do come and see your MSPs too, if you feel that you are needing some support and that things aren't there, because there may be things that we can help um, point towards things we can raise with um, individual people as well to see what, what other support um, is there. But yeah, just come and give us your experience too, because it's not, for many of us, it's not ours. Um, we can empathise in terms of barriers that have been put up in our way, in terms of um, the MSPs who have various impairments, but we need your experience too, to be able to inform what, what we are doing. Thank you, Gillian. And I have received a couple of questions on taxi, so I think it might be appropriate to pose the questions to our, uh, our councillor colleagues here today, because obviously licensing is, is very much regulated at local authority level. Um, so the question is, there were a couple of questions. One was again submitted anonymously, and another question on the same theme was submitted by Nettie. So the question is, what can be done regarding the lack of wheelchair and accessible vehicles in standard taxi ranks and what can be done to ensure a more balanced distribution of types of taxis across all cities and all local authorities and perhaps first I could go to John and then Alan. John. Yeah absolutely. So I fully understand that with the local authorities are responsible for making sure that we are promoting disabilities and independence when it comes to travel within each authority. And with taxis, that has been a problem. There have been a lot of barriers with that when it comes to taxi vehicles. There's not a lot that are suitable or adaptable in terms of making sure they are accessible for disabled people. So those taxis with the wheelchair, have wheelchair ramps, for example, they are the mostly for private taxi companies which um, if you have a low income or a low income family, that's a lot of extra money to have to pay for an accessible taxi, when really the council should be providing that extra adjustments for you and that extra funding to help improve that public transport access and to make sure that the taxi services are making sure that everybody has equal access to their services. Because whether a disabled person, they want to go and enjoy themselves, they want to enjoy their day, their night, it shouldn't matter if it's... The disabled people don't only just go out during the day, we also go out in the evening. So we need to make sure there's no barriers there, because a lot of those taxis are not available in the, in the evening. So we need to make sure we're looking at that area and how we can improve a lot more in terms of taxis accessibility. 
and making sure that that equality and diversity is really covered within the movement of making sure the taxis are accessible. Because we're at the minute we do not have enough accessibility in terms of the transport, there's not enough um, disability funding to help with that access towards services. So we really want to make sure that we are that we're needing a, a peer group really of, of disabled people to come together and really give us that strong voice and that really important view and make the decisions of how we're going to improve for the future in terms for local authorities and main cities in order to have the right and have the conversation with these taxi companies to start that conversation that they are also responsible for these barriers that are put in place. Because maybe they just don't understand that the barriers are there. We need disabled people, like disabled people have jobs. We go out, we need accessibility to every other place. We need to be involved in everyday life. So the disabled people need to have that choice of whether they want to be involved, uh, whether they want to go and have a job. So they need to, we all are responsible for the adaptability and the accessibility with, um, when it comes to taxis and bills moving forward. Thank you, John. Um, Alan. So, when I was a councillor in England, the, the, there was a sort of big clamour that people, well, private hire operators were wanting to expand and they wanted more private hire licences, but the council at the time said, we've only got 45, and they decided, OK, we'll let you have more, but it has to be adapted to be, the vehicle has to be adapted to be accessible to wheelchair users. And I think that's the way we do it, that we look at, if anyone's wanting a new hackney carriage licence or a private hire licence, then the vehicle has to be um, accessible. And maybe that's not just something for councils to do, but it's maybe legislation from here as well that would push councils down that route as opposed to sort of people sitting back and not thinking about it. No, thank you, Alan. That's an interesting point and perhaps something for MSP colleagues to reflect on as to what can we can do to help push that uh, uh, up the agenda uh, a bit. Um, next question um, is, has already been referenced by Pam and obviously is a big uh, hot potato issue and I'll put this to uh, all uh, uh, members of the panel and the question is from Ewan and it is as follows. I would like to ask the panel what they think of disabled paying for care charges uh, and when will the Scottish Government abolish them? So I think uh, that probably leads me first to our Scottish Government Minister, Emma. Yeah, care charges are um, particularly difficult because um, we recognise, obviously, that the cost of care can be so high, especially right now with, with just how um, so many different factors are, are playing into the, the cost rising, not just for the care, but for every other part of, of people's household budgets. It's, it's really high at the moment. And we, recognising that, do remain committed to removing all non-residential social care support charges uh, that formed part of our most recent programme for government 23-24. Um, so at the moment, what we're doing is working with local government to explore options to do that within the lifetime of this parliament. Um, obviously, I'll, I'll be speaking with Pam to get ideas on how we can do it within the year. Um, and we'll, we'll see what we can, we can cook up. Thank you, Emma. Um, and I would go next to Alan. Thoughts on the subject? I think it's really difficult because it's a really big sum of money and within, you know, the constraints the Scottish Government of any who has to try and t solve that problem. But I think it is something that does need solving because at the moment we've got free personal care, but when people apply for care, they don't realise the difference between what is classified as personal care and all care charges and I, th I think it's really important that if we're going to get rid of one bit of care we should uh, one, one bit of charging for care we should get rid of all all and pam thank you um and and i would agree with the, the point about about getting rid of it all otherwise we get into discussions about was that a, a social p or was it a medical p or what what was what was that um the, the support you were getting there um this is an issue that 
I have been campaigning on for as long as I can remember. And the first time that I got involved in this um, was with Etienne and Jim, uh, who we heard from earlier. Um, and we set up a, a, an organisation or a campaign at the time called Scotland Against the Care Tax. And I'm pretty sure that goes back to 2007 or eight, but it goes back a long, long time. And there is no doubt about it, it is a complex matter because the, the, the sum of money involved is not insignificant and we do understand um, the, the significant challenges that local authorities have got um, in terms of their budgets just now. But that is, I mean, it's, it's going to be nearly 15 years since this issue has been brought to the attention. And I'd hazard a guess it came to the attention of parliamentarians before then. Um, and in that 15 years, the number of disabled people who've been locked out of work because they couldn't afford to get the social care that they need, or they've been living in poverty. And we know the impact that poverty can have on just, um, not just your, your physical, but your mental health and therefore your ability to contribute. In those 15 years, I'd hazard a guess that a fair sum of money has been lost to the tax take. Um, if, if we really wanted to talk about it in pure financial terms. And I'm not suggesting that that's what we do want. But from a financial point of view, I think this is probably a really easy case to be made about preventative spend. But like with all preventative spend, you need to find the money to pay for it in the first place before you see those dividends coming back through. Because um, as someone said to me the other day, what do you think disabled people are going to do when they can contribute? Probably spend money. Um, probably go out and maybe get work and maybe see friends and again, spend money. So actually there will be, there is an economic argument um, to, to implement this um, sooner rather than later. And I look forward to uh, the offer to discuss that with the Minister um, today, uh, to discuss it after today, not today. There's too much on today for that, but um, I, look, I look forward to that offer um, to see, see how quickly we can do it. It is difficult. Nothing is easy. I think I said this the other day in the Chamber, like there's easy work's hard to find and hard work's no easy. And I think as disabled people, we find it very easy to find hard work. Um, and so I think we, we all just need to, be committed to it and get on and, and do it. John? Yeah, absolutely. I've just realised that with the, the payment of care, there's a massive debate amongst the costs at the minute for all the, the legislation that are constantly changing in terms of paying, whether it's direct debit or if it's um, living independency allowance. It, it all kind of adds up, and I think we all need to have. There's a lot of at the minute. There's a lot of barriers to second for, linked to the care and the choices available for their lives, where they need to have the right to be able to go out. And the problem is just going back to the local authorities are kind of undercutting and undercharging with the issues. There's not enough funding from the Scottish government at the minute in terms. So I feel like the government should be giving that funding to support people and the whole of anyone within local authorities to give, we should, every local authority should be given a budget to help disabled people and give them the rights to their free choice, their free options for themselves. They should have that free choice, that free care. They should not have to charge for care that they need. And this is a debate that we shouldn't be having. So this is a service that we are constantly debating and it seems to be going around in circles at the minute, but we really want to avoid having disabled people's mental health and well-being falling down we really want to make sure they become independent like which, which, which is what most of us want have that full accessibility going forward thank you john and Gillian. thanks deputy president officer one of the joys of going last on some of these things is that everybody's very eloquently said many of the things i thought um but i think we've discussed quite a lot the cost of doing it but i think we also have to recognize the cost of not doing it to disabled people so um that's certainly something we need, we need to consider how we work with local authorities as well. Many different local authorities do different things in different ways. And that's one of the, the intricacies of this. I was really pleased to see it in the programme for government this year. And we need to make sure that in amongst all the other very urgent things that need, um, that need dealt with, that this is, is prioritised and work is, is undertaken swiftly, that a decision is reached and then a way to do it is reached quickly as well, because one of the one of the things that often takes time in this place is deciding how we're going to do the thing we've decided we're going to do. Um, and actually, there is a level of urgency um, to this and making sure that we do make decisions quickly and implement them quickly, I think is really important in this too. Thank you, Gillian. Um, our next question is from James, and I think given that Pam is the deputy convener of the cross-party group on disabilities in the parliament, that it might be, well, 
directed to Pam. So the question is uh, from James. I have found it difficult to find uh, disabled groups uh, looking at policies that affect people with disabilities. Could this be something that could be set up? So perhaps Pam could explain the work briefly of the CPG and any other thoughts on the question? Thank you. Thank you. Um, and, and to James's question, it's a really, really important one. And actually, sometimes you feel like a bit of a project manager as a disabled person because you, you have to wade through so many different policies and um, so many different organisations to find your way. And it's really hard to, to navigate all of that. Um, there are incredible disabled people's organisations across the country, um, some or um, many of whom are represented on the cross-party group um, on disability. And we would welcome your involvement, James, so please do get in touch. Um, if we have your details from where your question was submitted, then we can um, proactively reach out and send um, a link so that, uh, so that you can. I think it was mentioned earlier on in Jim's speech about the date at which every local authority um, would have a disabled persons organisation in it. If I'm right, it was 2025, is that right? So thank you. So we're two years away from that. I, I'm not sure um, that we look like we're on target to, to deliver that. But it is really, really, really important because disabled people's organisations genuinely change lives. They're run by disabled people for disabled people. And they are not just there to um, provide support um, on a daily basis to get people into employment or to help people access um, care and support or to provide housing assistance. But they're there to provide peer support and also to be the voice of disabled people um, in rooms where there aren't often um, disabled pe people's voices there. So it's so important um, that we have more of these organisations. But it's also important that we know about it. So someone said to me once, if something isn't accessible and it's just not going to be, be a building or whatever, I mean, you know, the, one day there will just be everything will be. But if it wasn't, what would you do? And I said information. Because sometimes the best thing you can do for, for um, access and equality for disabled people is give them the right information. Because there's nothing worse than going somewhere and getting the wrong information about it. Um, so that goes a long way. And that goes um, also uh, to helping um, young disabled people and um, others uh, to, to understand where they can get support. And we, need to, we probably do need to get better at that. And actually, as an MSP, I'll, I'll take responsibility for making sure that through the channels that I have um, and the audience that I'm privileged enough um, to, to have, um, is aware of what's available in, in, in my area um, and hopefully we could encourage other MSPs to do the same. It's International Day of Disabled People on the 3rd, as we know, so maybe that's a point at which we could try and do that and promote organisations in, in local areas so that we can start to help people understand what's out there and what support they can get if they need it. Thank you, Pam. And I see that the time is running on the clock, so I think we'll have to turn at this stage to our last question. But it has proved to be one of the most popular questions. It's received 13 likes and it's from Amber and it will be open to all the, the uh, panellists to give their thoughts. So Amber has asked, um, we already have a youth parliament. Would the panel agree with me that it's now time for a disability parliament? And uh, Minister, I think it would be appropriate to first go to you. Emma. Well, presiding officer, you've come to the young disabled person who sits in the Scottish Parliament. So I think um, it'd be remiss of me not to point out that I want this parliament to be a parliament for young people, a parliament for disabled people, a parliament for everyone in Scotland. Um, I, I was never a member of the youth parliament. I think they do incredible work. Um, I've also been along to the, the rural and islands parliament, again, do incredible work. But they're filling a gap that it's our duty to close here and now. So I don't think that these should have to exist. Certainly if people want to have those spaces which are you know, explicitly for young or disabled people or rural and island residents, then that, that should be the space for them. But I, I'd like to, to see all of those groups represented far better and more regularly and consistently in, in this parliament itself. Thank you. Um, and I call Alan. I think very simply, yes. And probably disabled councils too. OK, well, that's a very clear, unequivocal statement. Um, Pam, over to you. Um, thank you. And there, there, there have been a number of different um, sort of iterations as to how disabled people's voices have been collected and then, and then used. Um, in different ways to affect change. And we heard some of um, the changes that have been affected because of those um, spaces. And most of all, the, what they've had in common is that they've been disabled people's organisations um, and um, organisations for disabled people too have also changed the dial. 
Um, I do I think there should be a, a disabled persons parliament. I would agree um, to, to, with Emma um, that actually all parliaments should be um, representative of disabled people. And so that would be my ambition that this place, I can't tell you how lovely it is to look out um, at Parliament and see it full of disabled people and our allies. Genuinely can't say how important um, and how amazing that feels. Um, but it's, <laughs> and it, it really would be lovely um, if, if this is what it looked like all the time. Um, but until then, uh, and, and we may not, we, hopefully it won't be too long, but until then, um, I think something like a disabled people's parliament for um, looking at the work the youth parliament does um, wouldn't be a bad idea at all. Okay, thank you, Pam. Uh, Gillian? I totally agree with, with Pam. I think it, a disabled people's parliament has to not be used as an excuse not to promote disabled people's inclusion in mainstream politics. And I think that's one thing that we would all have to keep a very close eye on, that it's not, um, that it's not being used like that. But I think one of the strengths of it is so often in this place, we end up talking about really high level things and only certain ones of us really get into the detail of certain pieces of policy and things, which encourages some of the working in silos that happens. And actually one of the good things about the youth parliament, the rural parliament, um, and probably a disabled um, people's parliament is that you can really get into some of those those issues and promote understanding and impact of some of those those issues themselves. So if that can then be if that good work can then be translated into this place and and legislation as a whole, like I think the youth parliament has done very effectively on on some issues as well. I think it could add an extra an extra voice to, to what's going on at the moment. And John. Thank you. I think that's an excellent question for, to end on, actually. I completely agree with what Emma has said. I feel that it's not the best idea to set up a disabled parliament specifically because that's, it feels it's a bit more exclusive in terms of society. It's gonna, it's prior, we really want to prioritise the perspective of disabled people for anyone, really. So whether any individual, we want equality, we want youth, we want representatives for everybody. I think it should be like a mainstream political parliament where we respect and learn from one another and we're all involved. We all are aware of each other. And I think if we have that exclusion, I feel as we're putting up a barrier that doesn't need to be there. I do understand that for British Sign Language as well, we struggle. We set up um, a lot of sign language parliaments. Um, uh, that would be very, very difficult because we're kind of undercutting the representation of people who use their voice and MSPs and anyone else who would like to get involved. So we really want to have that, that connection with each other and respect one another in our decisions. We need to have inclusion and accessibility within our policies and not just pick and choose different um, policies to look at. I feel like hopefully as we can see today, we've got a full of disabled people. I really would love everyone to start thinking about yourself and the future and getting involved in politics and become, get involved in the parties and the political parties and help have this pro provide the same needs and accessibilities for more opportunities and civil partnerships to all be involved with disabled people. That is what we're looking for. That is a political party that we should be responsible for and supporting that and having that accessibility and how we can have that full involvement within politics and moving forward for the future. Thank you, John. So um, we have actually come to the end of this uh, question and answer session, and I would like to take this opportunity to thank all our panelists for doing such a great job. Thank you. I would also like to thank our audience, both here in person and online, and for so many interesting and really pertinent, uh, thought-provoking questions. Uh, and um, uh, I'm just sorry that we didn't manage to, to take more, but as I say, that might be an opportunity to air some of those in the, in the next uh, uh, summit, uh, post-summit discussion to be led online by Pam uh, in a wee while. Um, I would also like to take this opportunity to thank all our BSL interpreters, because without them, we would not have been able to communicate so well today. And I, I hope that Jeremy, uh, from his hospital bed or wherever he's perhaps at home now, is, has been able to in, uh, enjoy the, the uh, conference. I know that he put an awful lot of work into this, Jeremy Balfour, MSP, 
uh, in advance and has helped to make it the success that it is. And I note that we have one of Jeremy's uh, colleagues here, Sue Webber, who is the Conservative uh, MSP for the Edinburgh and Lothian. So, welcome, Sue. Uh, so, um, I think it's now time for me to ask our panellists, except for Pam, if they would now resume their seats in the, the, the chamber proper. Because what I would like to do now... Oh, is and take off their uh, microphones. <laughs> and um, I think Gillian is stuck. Bill will come to the rescue. I might need to be unstuck. Um, so yes, because what I would now like to do is to call our, on our final speaker, uh, who is indeed Pam Duncan Glancy. And as I've said, uh, of course, you all know Pam, but also she is the Deputy Convener of the Cross-Party Group on Disability in this Parliament and indeed also has played a key role in ensuring that this uh, uh, summit took place today and uh, in ensuring that it uh, has been, I think, the success that it seems to have been. Uh, so, without further ado, Pam, over to you. Thank you, Deputy President Officer. And thank you to everybody who has joined us today, both in the chamber and online, for the first ever summit to mark International Disabled People's Day. I uh, would have been 11 when the first ever International Disabled People's Day started in 1992. And I think if I was to, to look back, um, or if I was to look forward um, from 1992 to now, first of all, I could never have dreamed of being um, in the privileged position that I am today. But I could also never have dreamed of having a parliament that is dedicated entirely and filled entirely with disabled people, our allies, our friends, our colleagues um, and our movement. And I can't tell you how proud I am to look out at every single one of you today because being in the room really, really, really does matter. And every one of you, um, in your own ways, whether it be in your organisations, whether it be in your home, be in your street, be in your community, in one way or another, you have shone a light for disabled people where you are, and today you've shone a light in here. One of my friends said to me when I got elected, and I said, it's going to be, I hope I can do the right thing by disabled people. And it feels quite, I, I hope my other MSP colleagues um, won't, uh, will, will appreciate this, but... It's really, sometimes it feels quite, quite scary being um, a member of the Scottish Parliament because you do feel a weight of responsibility, and so you should, because it is a privilege and a huge responsibility. But for me, it was always very much about not just representing the people of Glasgow um, and representing my party, but I made no apology that when I got elected, I wanted to do it because I want to represent disabled people across Scotland. And someone said to me once, um, well, first of all, I was told I was a one-trick pony, and I was like, well, there's a lot of people in here that are matrix, so I'm fine being the one-trick. Um, I said, and, uh, and secondly, I said, if not me, then who? And I was always really proud to do it, and I don't think I could be prouder today uh, to do that. And so I will always try and do everything I possibly can for disabled people. I also said when I got um, elected that I would put the ladder or the ramp out um, for other disabled people after me. And I promise for as long as I'm privileged enough to serve, um, I will do exactly that. Um, and I will do it with all of you because none of us, absolutely none of us, the 129 of us who normally sit in those seats um, or any of us, I guess, that are here today are the monopoly on wisdom for anything. And so we all need all of you. Um, and without you, we would not have made the gains that we have since 1992 um, when they had the first recognition of today. We wouldn't have the legislation that we heard about earlier. So please do not underestimate the power that each and every single one of you had. And when I got elected, and, and, and to go back, so I, ran, I, I got off track there, when I went back um, and said, I really hope I do the right thing by disabled people, the person said to me, well, sometimes you just need to be a lighthouse so that people can see the light and know that you're there and represent that. And today I think the Scottish Parliament has been a lighthouse for disabled people, hopefully across Scotland and across the world. And it should be very, very proud of itself. And so um, in closing, I want to thank, first of all, the Parliament staff, um, Roy and the team. I, I couldn't be prouder of the way that you've pulled this off. It is an incredible event. Um, it takes a lot of work and effort and energy to do anything in this building. Um, and to do, to do specifically an event like this, um, with so many disabled people here, shouldn't be unique, but it is. Um, is no mean feat. And the effort and energy and compassion that you and your team put to delivering today has not gone unnoticed. Um, and I'm sure that everybody here today will thank you for that. 
I'd also... I'd, I would also like to thank very, very much the incredible Dr Jim Elder Woodward for your speech to us today and for Etienne Dabaville for supporting in its delivery. I said earlier on, I mentioned my first job. Etienne and Jim gave me my first job in 2005 and they put their faith in me on that day. Someone who had no experience in the job, despite my kind of, I won't, I won't say embroidering my CV, but <laughs> certainly, <laughs> certainly making it look better than it probably was. Um, they put their faith in me on that day and set me on a path that I will never ever forget and I will stay on for the rest of my life. Um, and I wanted to return that favour and put my faith in you and give you the opportunity so that the world could watch and see how utterly incredible both of you are. So thank you for doing that today. Thank you. I would, I would also like to thank Baroness Tani Gray Thompson. Uh, I first met Tani, I think in 2012, when I did a parliamentary internship um, with Baroness Gray Thompson and Baroness Jane Campbell, names of, uh, of whom, both of whom, many of us in this room um, will know and love dearly. And I was incredibly inspired by both their tenacity um, for the, the, the work that they were doing for disabled people, but also um, their perseverance in working in, in the House of Lords in a building that probably wasn't, I mean, well, actually, there's no probably about it. When that was built, nobody considered disabled people at the time. Um, and uh, so I want to say a huge thank you, Tani, for your inspirational speech as ever. And, and, and I, say, I use that word inspirational, um, learned in the way that you described it today. And I hope that you'll um, take it in, in the way that I meant. Because looking and seeing people like Tani in rooms where decisions happen is really important. And Tani spoke briefly about um, the, the appointment system in the House of Lords. And every single one of us in this room will have a view on that. I have my own, um, which are for um, another day. But one thing that the House of Lords does do um, is represent people um, from a various different backgrounds because people can be appointed there because of the work that they've done. And both Tani Gray Thompson and Jane Campbell were appointed um, because there was a recognition that there weren't that many disabled people, <coughs> to say the least, uh, in the House of Commons. And so we will be forever grateful um, for the work that they do there. So thank you, Baroness Gray Thompson, for everything um, that you do. I'd also like to say a huge thank you um, to the panellists that I, I shared the panels uh, with this afternoon, to Gillian, to John, to Alan, to Emma, for their incredible hard work that they do day in, day out, be it in council chambers or the parliament um, itself. No matter what party they represent, I know how hard you work for the constituents um, that, you, that you represent. And I know that they will, that they will appreciate that, that being a disabled person in politics is not always easy and sometimes it can be a lonely place. And so I think it's really, really important for us to be able to share across, across party boundaries that experience and support one another. And um, Emma mentioned in her contribution that we, we all, or she said that she'd spoken and, and lent a lot uh, on Jeremy and I. I. I've lent a lot on pretty much everyone in here um, for various reasons, including um, when it comes to votes. But um, in, general, in general, I have lent a lot um, on people because you really do need the power of peer support. And so to have that peer support, not just in here, but out there from every one of you um, is incredibly important. And, and uh, I would also like to thank Jeremy Balfour, MSP, who I know you're watching online, or I hope you're watching online, Jeremy. I hope that we've done you proud. I've tried my best to, uh, to, to, do, uh, to do what we, we thought about and what you um, described the day that you came into my office and said, I've had a bit of an idea. Um, and then we both thought this actually has to happen. We need to make this happen. Um, so disabled people across Scotland um, owe you a gratitude um, for, for the day that you stepped into my office and made that suggestion. And I, I, I really appreciate it. I'm sorry you're not here today, but you're certainly here in spirit. And thank you um, for everything you do. And my final, um, oh, in fact, sorry, not my final, I have two more. Um, I'd like to also give a sincere thanks to the Deputy Presiding Officer for stepping in today on behalf of the Presiding Officer um, of the Scottish Parliament. Um, it really is an honour and a privilege for an event like this to be hosted by such an office as the Presiding Officers. Um, the Presiding Officers are the people in this room who make us, um, well, first of all, keep us on time, and I'm probably over time already, and I can feel, Alice, uh, I can feel Annabelle's eyes um, <laughs> saying, right, Pam, come on, wind it up. Um, and, but, but genuinely, giving, giving it the office, giving it the support of the Presiding Officer, 
elevates what we've done today um, to something incredibly important because it takes it not just um, above all of the work that we already do in our communities, but it takes it above party politics and indeed gives it the highest office that this parliament can have. And to give that to disabled people and to represent uh, and to, to um, remember Disabled People's International um, Day is, is really incredible. So thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. And, and thank you also to, to Alison Johnson, um, presiding officer, who can't be with us today. Um, and we're all thinking of you um, and hope to see you very soon. My final thanks um, of today goes to every single person who's joined us in person, who's joined us online, who's helped to make, make today happen. Whatever role um, you've played here today, whether you've asked a question, whether you've been here to listen, um, or whether you've encouraged other people to take part online and um, supported your members um, to do the same, it really matters. It really, really does matter. And I hope that this is not the last um, of these events. In fact, I hope this is the first um, of many of these events to mark International Day of Disabled People because it's really crucial that people understand that we have human rights too. And when parliaments do things like this and the world notices it, we cannot ever underestimate how important that is. And so we have an evaluation form, which might seem like a, a bit of a housekeeping thing to, uh, to, to almost close on. Please do fill that out afterwards because I know um, how passionate the events team feel about getting this right. Um, and so any feedback that you can give the events team is incredibly important. So please do um, fill this out today. And I'm thrilled that this will be the first um, of many, many events. Thank you so much for joining us. Please do celebrate International Day of Disabled People on the 3rd of December um, in whatever way um, you can, because it's so important that people understand um, that we're here and that we're in the rooms um, where decisions happen. And I want to just finish um, on this message. We've heard today a lot about change that we've seen over the years. And at times, change for disabled people really does feel glacial. But it is possible. And it's only possible because we have a collective movement who believes in the equality, human rights, and emancipation of disabled people. And for as long as that movement is in existence in Scotland, and for as long as I certainly have the opportunity to represent, um, to represent that here, I'm confident that we can create a Scotland which is the land of opportunity for all that I know it can be. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Pam. Um, I, I just have a few words to say, which is also to add my thanks to all of you and those who have joined us online. Uh, I think we could all agree, I hope anyway, that this has both been an uplifting afternoon and an inspiring afternoon. And I'm delighted I was able to step in. I've really thoroughly enjoyed uh, presiding over this event and I have found it extremely interesting and I have made a few notes of things I need to do to, to assist with the, the good fight. So, uh, just to uh, reiterate what Pam had said about the importance of filling in the evaluation forms, this will uh, be very helpful indeed, as these forms will form the basis of the, the feedback of future summits. There are paper copies here, and of course everybody will also be emailed an evaluation form next week. And uh, for those watching online, I would ask that they hold on for that exclusive uh, post-summit discussion that I referred to, which will be led by Pam Duncan Glancy, MSP. This will start in a few minutes and there will be, uh, Pam will have guests, which will be, uh, will be Theresa Burke of the Glasgow Disability Alliance and Ryan Cousin of the Scottish Transitions Forum. Uh, so there will be an opportunity to raise questions on issues that you have heard today. And with that, I thank you all very much for coming and wish you all safe home in due course. And I now close this uh, summit this afternoon. Thank you.
Scottish Parliament adjourned on the 25th day of March in the year 1707 is hereby reconvened. Designed by lead architect Enrique Morales, the building opened in 2004. Morales took inspiration for his design from Scotland's natural environment, its landscapes and its strong connection to the sea. He described the building as growing out of the land. This Parliament of Scotland may be a modern day Parliament and a modern day building, but the story of a Parliament in Scotland goes back much further. We can date a Parliament in Scotland all the way back to the year 1235. The Canongate was once home to the gentry of Edinburgh, the landowners, the traders and nobles of the day. However, over the centuries it has seen many changes. This era slowly declined and eventually became home to those less fortunate. The one constant throughout the years has been this building, Queensbury House. A 17th century townhouse once home to James Douglas, the second Duke of Queensbury and member of Scotland's old parliament. It now forms a working part of this new parliament's campus. The grand old doors of Queensbury House. This door is usually reserved for the likes of His Majesty the King, but it once welcomed people from a very different walk of life. Though Queensbury House began its life as a grand home, by the 1950s it had long served Edinburgh as a care home for the elderly poor and later a hospital. You see the important role that this building served in supporting those most in need in this letter penned by an anonymous author who remembers the importance of Queensbury House well. My mind goes back to 1912. By the well there's a crowd of private customers waiting for their dinner near the door. In the queue, there's a girl of 12 years. By her bare feet stands a huge pot. She's clutching a penny and hopes it won't be long before opening time. In her home, her seven brothers and sisters are waiting. Her father lost heart and died. There are some baleful looks from the private customers, the huge iron pot being the object of their comments. At last, the door opens. She explains she wants it filled up. The assistant, though busy, carries it out. She drags it round the corner where her sister is hiding. There's no talk at first, but as hunger is appeased, they all vote that's a lovely place they've found. The doors of Queensbury House as a hospital closed in 1996. The ghost of its halls left in silence to wander, though not for long. It was acquired in 1997 to serve the people of Scotland once again, the home of the new Scottish Parliament. Today's Parliament Garden is based on a traditional knot garden. This more traditional style is in complete contrast with the modern architecture around it. But just as Queensbury House itself has merged into the Parliament campus, past and present come together here too. It contains traditional box hedges, as well as a row of apple and pear trees located exactly where the Duke of Queensbury would have had his 17th century orchard. With a spectacular backdrop of Salisbury Crags and extinct volcano Arthur's Seat, the garden brings some tranquility to this very busy building. The Parliament is very conscious of its place in the landscape and the contribution it can make to the environment around it. 
As well as planting a variety of Scottish wildflowers in our gardens, we also have beehives on site. The bees and the beehives are looked after by a local business. And what is really something quite special is that the beeswax produced by the bees has been used to fill the Great Seal of Scotland. This is the Royal Seal that has been placed upon every act passed by the Scottish Parliament since it started in 1999. The bees, therefore, have a very important role to play in the lawmaking process and the Scottish Parliament's circle of life. Now, from our garden to our garden lobby. We've taken a little inspiration from the bees, as this is a hive of activity. Much like a beehive, a whole world in miniature exists within these walls, and everyone has their part to play. We have everything we need to enable our work within the building. Post office, cash machine, gym, coffee bar and more. This space may look familiar as it's the area often used for filming interviews. It is always centre stage regardless of what's taking place. The imposing stairs are a landscape for groups and organisations to stand proudly within when meeting their representatives. Like a great circulatory system which connects all of the different areas together, the garden lobby enables the movement of staff throughout. This is the path members take when they make an important journey. The road to creating laws. Recognise this room? This is the beating heart of the Parliament. The debating chamber, or Shomer Jesbich, is the meeting place where our representatives come together to engage and speak with passion about the matters affecting everyday life here in Scotland. Our team of broadcasting engineers work tirelessly to turn these impassioned exchanges into transmissions viewed all over the world. From this, our sound booth, we ensure that not one word is missed and with over 130 microphones, we miss nothing. Within the walls of our broadcasting suite, we convert material from across eight cameras into a stream of content, delivering to the people of Scotland the latest political news as it happens. Hakor is un hanan in Shaw. Did it catch that? Well, I was saying there's more than one language here. Some of our proceedings are translated into Gaelic or British Sign Language. We have specialised interpretation booths so that the words you hear are the words you want to hear or see. Having From the central tree. platform, our presiding officer oversees it with a vision for the Parliament and the authority to bring it all to a conclusion. So I guess that's the end, but just for today. Tomorrow we pick it up all over again. The Scottish Parliament is a turning wheel driving us down a long and winding road, aiming towards a better future and a better destination. My name is Deborah Desara and I'm the Recruitment and Talent Management Partner and I strategically lead recruitment and talent management at the Scottish Parliament. As an organisation, we're diverse, inclusive, welcoming and respectful and there's always a lot going on for staff to get involved with. Our strategic objectives and our work are based on our values of stewardship, excellence, respect and inclusiveness. Our values are embedded in our roles and in the way we treat each other and they're championed throughout the organisation. So why work at the Parliament? Well, we have flexible and hybrid working as standard and we're an inclusive workplace. We don't have a one-size-fits-all approach. We cater for individual needs. We have progressive and inclusive workplace policies and a focus on sustainability. We have a culture of respect and inclusion and everyone has the ability to make a difference. We carry out yearly pay benchmarking and we work in partnership with the trades unions to ensure that our pay remains competitive. We're a supportive employer and we help all our colleagues to develop further skills and we have high internal mobility. We use positive action in recruitment and where we have groups that are underrepresented, we ask these candidates to also apply to our roles. 
I'd really encourage anyone from a minority ethnic background and anyone with any disabilities to apply to our jobs. We're a disability confident employer and if disabled candidates meet the minimum criteria for any role, we'll invite them for an interview. All in all, we're a diverse staff group across the whole of Parliament and I really enjoy working here. Good afternoon and welcome to this uh, post-summit discussion exclusively um, for those of the people who are joining us online. Thank you so much to both of you uh, for joining me this afternoon. Um, I'm really privileged to, to be joined by Tressa Burke, who is the Chief Executive Officer of Glasgow Disability Alliance, and Ryan Cousins, who is a member of the Scottish National Transitions Forum. So thank you both for joining us here today. Um, and I just want to start by asking what I'll start with you, Tressa, if that's OK. What do you think was the most prominent and important issue that you heard about this afternoon? I think we heard about a lot of really important things and maybe actions that need to be taken for disabled people's poverty and inequality. Um, but the thing that stands out most of all for me, which actually was brought to life today at the, at the Parliament, was the power of peer support, the power of disabled people being together, um, supporting each other, showing each other up and having visibility and representation as well. Thank you. And, and Ryan, what was your reflection from, from this afternoon? Well, if I was to pick out something that stood out as a whole, was probably the whole thing of how disabled people, when they lend their voices to these kind of topics, you know, they need that, re they, they deserve that recognition that their voice is heard, valued, paid for, and made it seem like it's more than just, you know, oh, I'm saying this to get it off my chest. I am saying these things because I want to bring it to the attention of people who have my struggles, um, have been in similar situations to what I've been in as well, because I've been through my own transitional experiences where I've struggled getting access to the support I needed when I needed it. And that's something that, that you know, relates to a lot of the work I do as well within you know, the transitions area, because I've been involved with various organizations who have designed things like applications and funds and what have you, and support services and clubs that are designed for young people with additional support needs or disabled people or however you wish to coin it. Thank you. And that, that's really, really important. And I think the point that you both picked up on, um, and someone said it to me just as the earlier session finished, um, if, you're, if you're not around the table, you're probably on the menu. And I think actually that's quite a really good way of putting it. And I just wanted to, um, to, to say that just now when, when you've both brought that up, because I think being in the room really, really does, does matter. Um, so we're getting questions um, from colleagues online. Um, hopefully they'll keep coming um, and I'll be getting them sent to me as they come. So I'll, t I'll, I'll, I'll pick the first question first is from uh, Lynn. And Lynn has asked, as we have equality, the Equality Act and the Human Rights Act, disabled people often have their rights removed. Mm. How can we be ensured these acts are adhered to by services? And I'll start if it's okay with you, Ryan. Mm, I think the thing is, with that thing, it's all, like, the whole thing you say, how if you're not at the table, you're the meat on the table. Is that, is that how it went? You're on the menu, but yeah. Yeah, close enough. Yeah, same yeah that whole notion is how these people, because they don't have, if they don't have representatives, so someone within local authorities, social work or, you know, care services, 
and makes it much easier for the support measures they need uh, to be stripped away. Like point in case I moved from Glasgow City Council to North Ayrshire Council a few months ago when we were moving homes and a lot of the support services that I had in place were actually, you know, because we were, it was a difficult, it was a, it was a difficult move uh, in some areas, like, you know, on the, on the surface it looked easy, but like behind the scenes there were things that were not handed over as smoothly as they should have been to, between the local authorities. So how do we kind of, how do we avoid that kind of situation happening for a young person? I think the, the move around, um, we've often called it portability of, of care, actually, is the context I've heard of it in the past. But, but you're right, just moving from one local authority to the other can, can often come with a whole host of, host yeah. of issues. Um, Tressa, what, what do you think we need to do to make sure that disabled people's rights and the Equality Act and the Human Rights Act are... Big question. I think we need to do a number of things. So I think one of the things that the opportunity is there for at the moment is incorporation of the United Nations Convention on the Rights of Disabled People. I think that that does need to be incorporated into domestic law, but it needs to be incorporated with the full standalone rights to things like Article 19, the right to independent living, the right to accessibility, and a whole range of other rights that are embedded in that treaty and convention that don't exist in the Equality Act, so they would not be cutting across it. So we can incorporate them. We need to find a way of doing that. I think, though, also in relation to making sure that rights don't continue to be eroded. I was fascinated by the theme that was being presented today of International Dis uh, Day of Disabled People because there are many themes online and one of the ones that we'd found was recovering uh, progress for disabled people and that seemed to be launched quite late on the website as well. I think that that relates to the erosion of rights that have been happening and one of the things that needs to happen is that resources are redirected into public sectors, services like health and social care to shore up disabled people's access and opportunities to participate and live a full life. I think the other thing that was mentioned today that I would also back up, I think there's a real need for this, is that local authorities have got a major role to play in the delivery of disabled people's human rights because all the, the rules and policies at Scottish Government level are great and they are needed. We absolutely need that steer, but then they need to be empowered to deliver those services. So we need to build their equality competence, their disability equality competence. We need to make sure that they're resourced and then we need to help them understand disabled people's issues. So I think the government and the local authorities have both got this role to play and it would really help if we incorporated the UNCRPD. I think that point is really important about the, the role of national government and local government and working together and there could well be um, and hopefully there is an opportunity through incorporation to, to make sure all levels of government um, have a, a part to play and also are empowered to do what they need to do to support disabled people. Um, we've got a question from someone who um, it says from anonymous um, but uh, the, the question is many neurodivergent people receive late diagnosis and experience difficulty through not being able to access valuable support earlier. So the question is, how can the Scottish Government improve this? Um, and Ryan, I'll come to you first again. Well, I mean, I, as someone who has had a member of my family was diagnosed with autism at a very late age, uh, I'll keep their name anonymous for, you know, obviously context reasons, but because they didn't get their diagnosis till they were much older, it meant that a lot of the issues they encountered when they were a younger age could have been avoided if they had gotten the diagnosis earlier. And the thing is, I think as well, the longer something is, all, I mean, I mean, I know from experience, the longer something is undiagnosed, the more problems it can create for a person's long-term mental well-being. I think if you're gonna try and tackle that whole thing of getting a diagnosis of say ADHD, autism or whatnot, sooner than later is you have to be very upfront with yourself, you know, Look at how you interact with the world, um, how you respond to stressful situations, uh, how you approach certain topics like politics or whatnot. And you, under you begin to understand layers of your character, which the more you get yourself assessed um, by the right support services um, who understand those kind of additional support needs, uh, the longer or it means that you are preparing the more long-term preparations you can make for, you know, that kind of like working with those special needs that you have in the adult world, because in the adult world, it's more difficult to get those kind of, of support measures and assessments because of 
well, the limited availability that you have at an older age. And that's why there's probably that case that there's a lot of, a lot of disabled adults, um, both physical and non-physical, going around with, you know, hidden disabilities that they don't even know about until they're much older. And the point I think you made about the learning early could explain some experiences people have, I think is really, really important. Tressa, what do you, what do you think about this and, and what do you think the government could do to improve support um, at an earlier stage? I think this is again about government policy um, and then policy being devolved at a local level. So it's, the, it's about the role of health and social care practitioners and particularly education as well when you're talking about children and young people. So them having their awareness raised and um, also awareness being raised and education um, amongst the general population as well about the kind of things to look out for so that people can identify that their own children might need an assessment or they might need additional support schools um, being part of that as well. I certainly know that there is definitely something happening just now in Glasgow because amongst health visitors and others just now there seems to be a much higher level of knowledge and attention to potential red flags um, for these things. I've just heard that anecdotally so something's happening just now which I think is maybe advancing this and we just need more of that, more of the kind of education. And I think as well, just what's in my head, um, if you're going to try and get this stuff looked into it. Uh, the, like, the sooner you get it looked into at a younger age, um, the more people you can actually have involved in regards to getting, say, an assessment for an autism diagnosis or any other form of additional support needs, because the plan can then be more person-centered. The young person's at the center of the process. Um, you have the parents, carers, you have schools, you have social work, you have all that kind of stuff. All those kind of people involved in a manner that is co cohesive and is basically a miniature coalition to try and understand, okay, what kind of additional support needs does my young person have and how best can I work around them so that they don't have to deal with the problems. Like, they have less problems to deal with the older they get and how they can try and build their interdependence, not just on themselves, but also on people who are there to help them. And I think um, the point you made, Tressa, about the health visitors in Glasgow, um, I think there's been, a, there's been a directive through the promise, is my understanding, to look at a broader approach to how we support people. And that's one of the things that they've done. We heard this in committee um, this week in Glasgow. They've, they've put some resource into health visitors. So it doesn't, necessarily, it doesn't surprise me, actually. Um, but that's an example, I think, of where national policy direction can change what happens at local government. And, and obviously, if you're, you're seeing a difference there. So, um, so that's really good. And your point about the coalition built around the person is really important, Ryan. And, you know, that's we've heard of people call it a multidisciplinary team. Um, but it's also important that that includes third sector organisations and peer support as well, for all the reasons we heard earlier. Um, education was key there, and Tress, I think you mentioned it. Um, we've got a question on education from David. Um, and David said, what about the barriers to education that still exist? So that's, that's David's question. What about the barriers? And, and, and I feel the kind of almost the sigh that's went, and what about the barriers um, in education? So what could, could I ask you to start on that? Because I know the work that you do in learning and uh, GDA. So our whole um, delivery model was based on disabled people feeling lonely, isolated, lacking in confidence and not faring well in education, either in earlier life or if they became disabled later on in life, not having the chance to learn or relearn to do to do something else, either whether that's for work or whether it's just for, for, uh, for living their lives. So I think the barriers are interrelated and multiple to education. Um, so if you're talking about young disabled children that you know that is the only group in society that can be forcibly educated separately from their their mm -hmm. peers mm -hmm. legally as we know and um, i think we've made strides in that and we see more disabled children and young people at mainstream school which is great but that's only great if they've got support not just support with the medical things they need and they do need them they need the access to the speech therapy the physiotherapy and all those things are really important but they also need to have the chance to attain and to thrive educationally and with qualifications as well but i think that education for disabled people is about the lifespan it is about lifelong learning it's not just something that ends at 16 or 
in the past where, where disabled young people went through a kind of loop of uh, FE colleges and did independent living skills for five years, then ended up coming out in their early 20s with no hope of anything to do or anywhere to go or any real aspiration. So I think that it needs to be about that broader learning for life, not just for educational attainment. That, that point's crucial. We've got a question um, that touches on that from Johnny, which I'll come back to. Um, Ryan, before I move on to that question, what do you think uh, yeah. needs to be done in education? Well, I think as well, you, what you have to do within the educational systems, you have to look at basically the whole process of what's working well and could work even better. If. And I think, if I was to pick a moment in my educational years, which really stood up, it would have to be my five years at City of Glasgow College. Amazing building, you know, great staff, but at the same time, Sometimes when you wanted support services for like, little things in there, you wouldn't always get them. And throughout my five years, there were constant hurdles I had to overcome within each uh, layer of the, of the course to actually you know, get myself in a position where I was performing to the best of my ability as a student. Uh, point in case, my first um, uh, interview for my, I think it was my third year course, uh, there were like changes made last minute on the day of the interview and I had to then rearrange to get a second interview which didn't happen until like two to three months later. Uh, then going into my, I think it was fourth year, there were a lot of points where, where I would have say a note taker for class for, or even a scribe mm. or whatnot for an assessment. I didn't have that in place. Um, sometimes the teaching style of a certain unit wasn't actually working to, you know, working to the best of its ability because it was done in a way that my brain couldn't process and so small changes had to be made to even make it through you know, that course as a unit. And then my graded unit, which was a whole other story in itself because the first pitch I even put for a graded unit, which is going to be a travel vlog documentary in um, China, my course lecturer didn't even understand the whole concept of this travel vlog because it wasn't just like a little holiday travel vlog. It was going to be a journal, a, a kind of a, a chronicle of sorts on a trip with my martial arts school at a monastery in Shaolin where you would see my growth as a young person because, I mean, it was a big experience. It was going to be a big experience because I, as a person, was going to evolve over that course of two weeks from... You know, from one, basically from one being into another. But she didn't get that. She understand that was kind of the whole theme of the, the travel vlog in itself was a transitional journey for me. And I think in, in what you've highlighted there is that it's not always just about the additional support disabled people need. You've also just got the general issues that everybody has with education and their understanding of it. Um, they, we've got a question now um, from Johnny who has asked, um, and it's about the, the point that Tressa, you made earlier on about then transitioning to what, doing what after you've, you've been to education. And this is specifically about work. Right. The Disability Confidence Scheme is failing to tackle the disability employment and career progression gap. Can we have a Scottish lived experience informed scheme? Tressa, what, what would you say to that? Again, it relates to all the barriers, doesn't it? So like education and like what you were saying there about the, the, the difficulties and the challenges and people, you know, the, the health bath, the social work bath, it's the same with getting taxis to and from college for some people. It's social work in the college fighting it out. So I think it all also relates to work. Um, the disability confidence scheme is a good idea in theory, but it's tokenistic and anybody can, you know, win that badge and put that badge on. I think what needs to happen for disabled people to have access to, to work is that disabled people themselves need access to education and learning and qualifications and experience, work experience, so that employability, but also employers, and I think possibly even more importantly and crucially, need to have their knowledge and skills and confidence built about working with and employing disabled people, giving them meaningful work that pays enough and flexible adjustments in their work. One of the best kept secrets as you know, Pam, is access to work, which is a DWP employment scheme for disabled uh, employees. And that's not available to get before.
before work, so it would be great if that was something that could help people into work. But once people are working, they can get that, and employers can get that. Some employers, not all, to make adjustments um, to the person in the workplace. I think one of the things that's maybe shone a light on more flexibility in working has been the pandemic, because it's enabled more people to work at home. So that's one of the, you know, if there could be a silver lining from something so awful, something that maybe has been enabled more disabled people to work at home. But the number of jobs available where disabled people can work at home are actually very small. So it's a bit of a myth that that's a panacea that solved everything. So we need employability and employability. We need good opportunities, we need job creation, and we need a combination of things to make things more accessible so that disabled people can thrive. I think, I mean, you've, you've just perfectly put it, I will try and resist the political point about working from home um, and, and my views on that, but I think um, it's, it's really important. And someone said to me before, it could, might have actually been you, Tressa, um, that said this, but forgive me if I've put words in your mouth that weren't yours. Someone said, you know, you get the fit to work assessment. Well, what about fit to employ um, and I actually think that's a really really key point um, because you know you can do all the work that you can with disabled people to prepare them for work but actually you get to a situation where employers are not necessarily enlightened enough um, to, to not discriminate. Um, Ryan what's your view on that? Well, it's, it's, I mean how I look at it is basically the thing if you want to guide and support that young person with additional support needs you first have to understand them that's why you know I uh, going in my last year of college I had a whole DSA report uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, it's basically a disabled students report, if you will. The basic kind of outline what kind of support measures I needed in place. And that report, extensive, thorough, detailed, and whatnot. Basically, if you ever wanted like basically a portfolio or like a pass a, a descriptive passport of who I am as a as a college student, that was basically your go-to. And that report wasn't actually even looked at by my course lecturers until like four or five months, or maybe even longer than that. Like months, like months after I was actually on the course. It was only once I started getting into my graded unit project in the last uh, block of said course, which was my second year of the media course, that they actually started looking at it because they realized, okay, he actually needs these support measures in place if he's gonna actually, you know, produce his graded unit project. Because like, there, there have been hiccups here and there where scribes and note takers, I needed in class for, you know, assessments and whatnot were not being put into place. And, you know, this, the, the report not being read was kind of like the final straw, like, you know, this, this can't go on any longer. How do you expect, like, you know, a young person with those additional support needs to perform to the best of their ability in the workplace or, you know, a class, classroom if they don't have the mentioned, you know, support measures described in their report mm -hmm put into place it's, and it's, it's not so and it's, and it's, and just what's in my head it's not like big adjustments of any by any means it's just little things mm -hmm. that help build you know a bigger development yeah, it's, it's, it all cumulatively supports disabled yes. people to do um, to, to do what they need to. And actually, it illustrates the point Tressa made earlier on, which was you can get that support in place. So you, obviously, the, the DSA um, list of what um, you, you need and what support should be available. If you then don't have a, an, a, an organisation or an employer prepared to implement it or look at it, then it doesn't, it doesn't yeah, help at all. Do. Um, so we've got a, a number of other questions here. So I'm going to... Um, come to a question from Zita. Um, Zita has said, you tell us to keep up the fight, but a lot of us are tired. Especially when we hear that a director of social work says stuff like, we can't afford your human rights. So the question from Zita is this, how do we stay strong? I'll start with you, Ryan. I think the thing is, after you, you, when you've experienced those kind of defeats, hurdles, hiccups, and setbacks, you learn to roll with those punches. It's always just this case of forward momentum, manifesting that Yes, you might have missed out on that opportunity, but something else will come up along the way. Thank That's you. the way I look at it. Thank you. Um, Tressa? I think it's what I was saying earlier on about peer support. Mm -hmm. I think whilst we're waiting for the changes in the structural inequalities, which are massive and they are slow to come, and there are some glimmers and lights of hope, like the ILF opening, yeah. um, so there are some pieces of great news, but we are waiting for, for much, much more to fall into place for disabled people. And one of the things that um, disabled people's organisations can do is provide peer support, opportunities for people to come together, opportunities for people to build their confidence, build their collective voice, build their individual voices, if that's what they want to do, and be able to just take stock, take a beat and get back up again. 
and I think it's fine if people feel tired and need to take time out from that. There are people amongst us who are paid, so we have the privilege of having to get back up out of our beds in the morning because that's our job, and we'll keep that going, and we'll, we'll wait for you to come back if you're too tired. I, I totally understand the frustration, though. I do think that in every global crisis, in every, you know, the war, the um, Hurricane Katrina and COVID, and now the cost of living crisis, disabled people do fall to the bottom of the pile. So it's exhausting to have to keep doing this. And I'm now in my third decade, at the end of my third decade of working with and for disabled people. And I am tired, but I'm energised by the brilliant appetite to change things that I see and the number of people that stay involved. So I think DPOs have that hope that role and just taking support from friends and family if you're not in a dpo there might not be one in your your local area a disabled people-led organization but having support having people who understand you i think it keeps us all going it really does and it's that kind of the peer support is really 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 crucial i remember someone said to me you know what's better for an event um, for disabled people are they early birds are they night owls and i said well if they're anything like me they're permanently exhausted pigeons like it's just constantly you're just exhausted um, it really is, and there's like the perseverance and resilience that you need to have is just unbelievable. And, and I know you've got it in abundance, Teresa. Um, the, you um, and, and, and Ryan and I have only recently met, um, but I can see already that you do too. It's the whole. Um, the, well, I just, it's just, it's a running on fumes approach at the end of the day. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's a good way to put it. Um, you mentioned uh, disabled people's organisations there, Teresa. So we've got a question from Jean. Um, and Jean has said, when do the panel realistically think we will get the Centre for Independent Living in, in, in every local authority? So I'll come to you first, Tessa, because you mentioned it, and then I'll, I'll come back to you, Ryan. Well, we've been running a project called Future Visions for Social Care, and we've had a researcher from Glasgow University working alongside us. And we, um, we've done a few pieces of research. One of the pieces of research is called Be Bold, and mm -hmm. it is about what what is needed for disabled people to be able to live a full life, a life of independent living. And the researcher from Glasgow University's conclusion is that it needs a DPO, a disabled people-led organisation in every area, whether that's a CIL, whether it's an organisation like GDA. Glasgow's very lucky because it's got both, mm -hmm. but it needs something. It may not be a CIL, and I, I would be concerned about being too caught up in it having to be a CIL in uh, case that became a barrier to it, nothing happening at all. But we know there are access panels in many areas. Mm -hmm. We have got yeah, things on which we can build, ideally a CIL though, because of the connection with social care and the need for people to get that advice and, and guidance about social care and um, how you navigate that system. But I think um, it's, it's a long way off, but that particular report is making the recommendation and there were opportunities with Feely and the recommendations he made. There are opportunities within the National Care Service, so it feels like a long way off, but maybe it's not as long as some of us fear and we can keep pushing for it within the kind of mechanisms for participation within the National Care Service. And I think there'll be opportunities within that bill when it, when it comes yep. um, to do so. that. Ryan, what, what, how long do you think it'll be? Well, I mean, like, it's, for me, like, it's the clear and concise communication. I think it's going to make or break the deal. You know, I think if we have more correspondence between the different people within these different uh, areas of, you know, Scotland, there's more. If you have, if you have them talking about other people with it, you've got more talking about it as a whole, mm -hmm. and then it gets to a wider audience. You essentially have to, you, you, you have to expand the horizons. So, I mean, you can talk about it, obviously, within the network, but at the same time, if you talk about about you know I talked about talk to the public about it, um, that then that creates you know buzz around the idea of this and what was it? Um, so oh, having I, a DPO or a or a CIL in every area. Yeah, I think with the, yeah with with either of those, it's that whole thing of the more people know about it, the more the bubble of information about it will expand and it can be sent out for more like more to more people in like in the form of evaluations and surveys and information brochures and leaflets and what have you information transparency and availability is basically i think a key factor in for e in either in either of those thank you we've got um five more minutes i think there's three questions so i'm going to ask two of them together if that's okay so we've yes. got a question from sheila and a question from douglas um, and the question from Sheila is, what about the rise of hate crime and public perception of disabled people as scroungers and benefits? And the question from Douglas 
is about how widespread tokenism that Tressa talks about is. I think the two are related because it's about attitudes to disabled people. So how widespread is tokenism and how are we going to address the issue of hate crime when people think um, disabled people are benefit cheats or scroungers? I'll go to Tressa first, if that's all right. Um, I'm going to start with the second question first. I think that the media has a massive part mm. to play in fueling um, stereotypes and fueling prejudice against disabled people, um, but it is not helped by the right-wing ideology coming out of the Tory government at the UK level, where you have us now looking at disabled people being even further pushed into poverty through the changes that are going to be made to work capability assessments. So I think that's massive. We know that hate crime is on the increase. We do all we can as disabled people-led organisations to support disabled people to cope with the challenges and the stigma and the, the you know, terrible pressures from neighbours that they get. It's very, very prevalent amongst our members, this type of experience. And to report it as hate crime, but there is a, a lack of willingness to do that. There is a reluctance to do that for many complicated reasons. Um, one of the main reasons being that they don't necessarily think anything will happen. Mm -hmm. You know, they don't necessarily believe that they'll be believed or supported. So that's in relation to the first thing. The second thing about tokenism, I have a view on that and I think it is because it's easier to just move around the pieces um, rather than to tackle the root causes. And we speak a lot about the cost of living crisis, but actually disabled people have been living in poverty for decades. Disabled yep. people's poverty and inequality has been known, has been academically researched, has been proven in every you know, social attitude survey and whatever surveys that we run in the country and the census. We know the employability rates, we know the number that are living in deep poverty, and yet we don't act. And I think it is just put in the too hard to act pile. And so then we end up with tokenism, but we need to actually start to tackle things in a much more meaningful way. It's really important. Um, think, briefly, uh, Ryan. Yeah, and I think in the context of the hate crime side of things, it's the whole, it's this whole thing of how you feel like if you actually stand up to those who, you know, try and, you know, paint you as the freak show, you feel like you're poking the hornet's nest because some, those people who, you know, actually conduct hate crime without hesitation, because of you know they, they, they sit on a higher they feel like they sit on a higher pedestal because they're not disabled um and then they, they, they the whole thing but they try to use the whole um angle of blame games you know basically i'm in a worse situation than you because you know you're this and that and mm. i'm like i've got this and this going on and that makes my situation far worse than yours and the context also of like uh tokenism I always ask, I would ask, and that was on my mind, you know, coming to this, you know, how do we, how do we make the access to support systems more person-centered and less, you know, tokenistic in a, in, in a, in a, in a sense? That's, that's exactly the point. We have one minute left, so I'm going to ask a question from someone who hasn't given us their name, but it's a great question. Um, Jim Elder Woodward spoke about solutions when disabled people's organisations develop and manage innovative projects. So the final word from both of you, they've said, can Tressa and Ryan mention some of the best projects they're aware of. We don't have time for them all. There's millions, I'm sure. Um, Ryan, um, just very briefly, one of the best projects you're aware of. Um, ones I've actually been involved in, uh, like Children in Scotland's Access All Arts Fund, which you know, I was involved in the uh, like design and launch of, and also I left Scotland's Transition Fund, which I am also a young ambassador for, and also an applicant of, uh, and also the Compass application, which I designed with the Divergent Influencers team who are associated with the Scottish Transitions Forum and Association for Real Change Scotland. Excellent. Thank you. Much appreciated. Um, Tressa. I'm going to say uh, the support programmes and services that Glasgow Disability Alliance runs. So that's learning and development, that's our welfare rights services to maximise people's benefits, our mental health and wellbeing supports and our digital supports. You know, it's a full range of things that shouldn't need to exist because we do not want to be providing services. Um, but we found ourselves plugging gaps. And the other wonderful thing is ILF Scotland. Um, and the, the new work that they're doing to try and open the fund to new applicants. So that's a brilliant thing too. And I would plug all the DPOs in Scotland as well. 
Thank you. Thank you to both of you. What a great note to end on. There are incredible organisations, including your, your own and um, that you're both part of across Scotland. And I'd like to thank them today for everything they do. We celebrate them on International Disabled People's Day as well as disabled people themselves and our, our friends, allies and families. Thank you both. Tressa Burke, Ryan thank Cousins, you. you've been great. Thank you to everyone online. Thanks Much appreciated. Invite. And uh, hope to, to see you all again, either in person or virtually sometime soon. Thank you. Thank yes. you.